nuclear chipper uh, and trying to get comfortable because people have been there since way so, before nine o'clock in the morning. I gotta get so that thought that we're holding now, back to that perfect phone call that the former president said, part of the was 11,000, find me 11,780 votes. From what you know, what you see. Are you local, by the way? I'm national. Okay, uh, I want to give priority uh, to the people oh, who are bold. who are uh, okay. Atlanta journalists. Well, we're all here. There you it's go. okay. okay. We have someone who you know can, can share questions. We're all on the same team here. Don't you want to that question? Yeah, I do. Uh, go, go ahead. I'm just... So that 11,780 like, votes, that phone call from the president, from what you know right now, was it perfect? I don't have an opinion on it. None at all? No. Nothing? No. George, I you don't. didn't survive today, but do you believe you had critical information that could help this grand jury yes. come to a conclusion? Uh, I thought it was possible, but it wasn't up to me to determine whether or not that information was critical. Okay. That is entirely up to the 24 people who were chosen by like the grand jury process. If you if this goes to trial, are you willing to testify and do you think it's important? Uh, I'll cross that bridge when it comes to it. What I don't know. What like among the witnesses? Uh, so, it's funny, we were sitting there, I was there with Jeff Duncan for a while, and I'll, tell, I'll talk about Jeff because he's been very public about testifying. Um, everyone was very calm. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about everything and anything except the case. Because on some level, and it was unspoken, we didn't want to taint each other's testimony. Uh, uh, I find Jeff Duncan to be wry and erudite and interesting um, and uh, worthy of the position that he has sort of in the media firmament right now. Have they told you any other expectations, obligations for you? For as far as I know, I'm done. As far as I know, this is it. What would bring you back? Another subpoena. George, thanks. You thanks. Right. Anybody else? Will you still be covering this indictment even though you're a part of it? What a good question. I don't know. I'm actually wrestling with that. Like, to what degree am I compromised? The uh, Because there's only so much that I can say where some clever defense attorney will go, ah, you're biased, and what are we supposed to do now? Um, problem is, I'm a political journalist. I write about politics in Georgia, and I'm good at it. It's part of the reason I'm here. It's because I spotted something that day. Breaking right now, we are awaiting the grand jury's decision on potential indictments in the investigation into attempts to overturn Georgia's 2020 election results. Around 8 p.m., we found out voting had begun. And moments ago, our Nick Wooden tweeting out that the convoy is en route. Judge McBurney is in the courtroom. Seemingly, there has been a lot of inaction all evening long, but a flurry of activity over the course of the last 15 minutes has begun to change much of what we are reporting and much of what we are thinking right now. Zach Merchant joins us now. Let's talk a little bit about the belief that this envelope may be on its way to Judge Robert McBurney in downtown Atlanta, where it has indeed been rendered about what the grand jury has elected to do here. That's what we're hearing right out of the court right now. And, and Faith, I think you have an important update for us here. Um, well, we are checking. We, The New York Times is doing a report right now that the indictment, a sealed indictment, has been handed up. That's what we're hearing from the New York Times right now, and this is the first step to it being unsealed that we could potentially find out charges and the indictment. So that's the latest information that we have right now as the reporters are in the courtroom awaiting to see what happens next. Evening. So we've heard from George Cheedy, who was ready to give the information that he knew, but he was not asked, he was not called in. Why is that? Well, in Georgia, you don't need a whole host of witnesses in order for a grand jury to return an indictment. And, and we should be clear here, too, it is up to a grand jury. They can return what's known as a true bill. That's what you think of when you hear an indictment. It means that a grand jury, a majority of the jurors on that grand jury, believe there's what's known as probable cause that a crime was committed. They can also return what's known as a no bill, and that means they saw the prosecutor's case and they thought, you know what? No, this doesn't pass the smell test. No crime, in our view, was committed here. And I think this is a good segue, a good moment, especially as we're waiting for what may come out of Judge Robert McBurney's courtroom in the, the coming moments here to talk about what an indictment is and what it's not. To be sure, 
Any indictment is a serious thing. It is a, a serious step in the criminal justice process. And certainly, if you're named as a defendant, it is extremely serious. That said, a grand jury indictment does not mean that somebody has been found guilty. The burden of proof required to indict much lower than the burden of proof required to convict at trial. And it should also be noted that in a grand jury, this is in a lot of ways a prosecutor's ideal situation. Unlike in court, unlike at a trial, in the grand jury room, there is only the prosecution. There's no defense attorney present. So prosecutors get to present in a lot of ways what is their idealized version of the case, their best version of the evidence that they have. Now, what comes next, what we see, um, we're gonna have to keep a close eye on, but again, all signs point to the document is on its way to Judge Robert McBurney's courtroom right now. So here's what makes this unique and significant in the state of Georgia. Correct me if you think I'm wrong on this. Georgia is one state, as opposed to New York, <coughs> as opposed to the federal system, that does not like to televise court cases. But that's a different story here in Georgia. We could see this televised, one of the few places in the United States where Mr. Trump is indeed indicted and could find himself and the proceedings being telecast to a nationwide audience. Uh, absolutely, and Georgia is a little bit of an outlier in that respect, especially at least when you compare us to the federal system. The federal court system is historically, I don't want to say notorious, but historically known for a real aversion to cameras, both print and still inside of a courtroom. But in Georgia, cameras are typically allowed inside of a courtroom for all sorts of proceedings. And Zach, we are actually taking a look inside the courtroom right now. We're working on getting audio for everyone, but you can see that that is Judge Robert McBurney, and he is live inside the courtroom. Um, we did see, like I said, our Nick Wooten um, reported that the convoy was mobile to the uh, courtroom, and you can see here a large stack of papers. So we are working once again to get that audio for you. So we can um, bring to you what's going in. But once again, this is something that we have been waiting on all day. Um, the jury started, I believe the courthouse opened up at 8.30 this morning. We saw several folks walk in and out, including Jen Jordan, a former state representative, B. Wynn, a former, um, uh, excuse me, a former state senator is Jen Jordan. B. Wynn is a former state representative, so they both gave their testimony walking in and walking out of the courthouse. We also saw Gabriel Sterling speak to the jurors today. Give me a sense, Zach, of what sort of choreography are we seeing right now? What is the judge in the process of doing, and who are the individuals that are here inside witnessing all of this? Well, again, it's a little difficult to tell just without the audio, but generally speaking, and this is another important distinction between our system here in Georgia and at the federal system, you might remember the federal indictment unsealed by special counsel Jack Smith yeah. was unsealed on a motion um, and in a lot of ways took most folks by surprise. It came out late in the day. Here in Georgia, uh, an indictment has to be physically read into the record. Mm -hmm. So anything that a grand jury returns if it's a true bill indictment, it's got to be taken typically by a clerk to a judge, yeah. and that judge will physically let me pick up the paper and read it. Typically a very ministerial and pretty routine event that goes on countless times in a courtroom. Yeah. So the choreography is significantly different from a trial jury. It has its own nuances here and it's its own formality in a way that sets precedent. Yeah, it does. And I think the best way to think about a grand jury is sort of the public's first pass at a case. It's the first time that somebody outside of any involvement with the case, either a prosecutor or a defense attorney or somebody who may be a witness or have some connection to the evidence, gets to look at what the state has collected and gets to say, in their view, whether a crime was committed or not. It should also be noted that unlike at trial, at a criminal trial, a unanimous verdict is not necessary to hand up an indictment in Georgia. All it takes is a majority of grand jurors to say yes, and a true bill indictment will be returned. And it should be noted that this does not infer guilt or innocence. No, it, it's certainly not a pronouncement of guilt. It is, in a lot of ways, we, we hear you know, probable cause. That's the legalistic language that a grand jury has to find. They have to find that there's probable cause that a crime is committed. Legal experts will vary in sort of the percentage of certainty that that means, but a, a lot of times they'll say it's 
I want to give a little bit of an update here. You are taking a live look inside the courthouse where moments ago we saw that the judge left the courtroom. He did ask reporters to leave the courtroom, and we can confirm that an indictment has been handed up. Um, Zach, let's go back to you talking about just the process here. Um, something that you made of note, it only takes 12 jurors to hand up an indictment. So now that we can confirm that, that it was handed up, what happens next? Well, what happens next is this is in a lot of ways the beginning of the long march to trial and we should put a caveat in this too many the vast majority of criminal cases end long before they see the inside of a trial room most end in plea deals this case while we don't want to say anything definitively if there was ever a case where i would be willing to bet anything that it would proceed on the tracks toward a trial this would be it the former president has maintained his innocence in the other three cases that he has been charged in uh, and he has vowed to take every one of them to trial this is in a lot of ways the beginning of that process why does the uh, I'm, I'm sorry Kate, go ahead <laughs> i don't want to put you on the spot there sure. but like i said our crews and i'm excuse me we're getting just um text and all of this information real time bringing it to you and the question here is so we just found out that all the reporters that have been gathered in that courtroom for over an hour judge mcburney he left we saw briefly a stack of papers he handed it to a woman in an orange dress they all walked out the back the judge left and all of the reporters also so left the room. Any idea why he would have asked them to leave the courtroom? Is this standard procedure? Is this something that you've seen before? Or is this something that we'd have to figure out? A little tough to say, especially you know, only knowing what we know from, from the outside here. And I, I'm, I'm very eager to hear what our, our reporters in the field are, are going to tell us. I know they'll be able to give some more context to this. Yeah. My hunch is, one, that given the sort of typically routine nature of reading an indictment into the record, there isn't any sort of extraneous commentary from a judge, and so it's not unusual in, in, in my experience to see a judge read it and yeah. say, okay, that's it, moving on. This is the, the very legal side of things. As far as reporters being moved out of the room, it's likely because whatever happened in there is over, and because we may, and I want to stress may, we don't know for sure, but we may be hearing um, from some other officials connected to this case, in which case reporters would want to be ready for that. So as we all sit here tonight, I look at these pictures and I think about the course of the last two and a half years, why has it taken so long to get to where we are tonight? That's, that's a fantastic question. Um, and it's one that I think we've been asking District Attorney Fani Willis for a long time now. Mm -hmm. It's one that we'll continue to keep asking her especially given sort of what we've discussed here, the burden of proof compared to, uh, the burden of proof required to convict at trial, fairly low in a, a, a grand jury room. That said, and this, I hate to speculate here, let's call this an educated guess. Yeah. If you were the district attorney and you were contemplating, investigating, contemplating, ultimately looking for charges against the former president of the United States, you've got to imagine that they would want to very much take their time and look at as much evidence as possible and my yeah. hunch is that this long march to this moment this close to two year march to this moment is a result of that more than anything else it's a long time coming this investigation i do want to give you all a couple of updates from inside of the courtroom like we said our reporters were asked to leave moments ago but nick did tweet out he said he asked mcburney what that stack of papers said he says he didn't give it a good look so we're still working to see what exactly those stack of papers were but we can confirm that an indictment was handed up and like i said if you were with us moments ago we saw uh someone bring the stack of papers the judge handed it to a woman in an orange dress and then they walked out and we're taking a live look outside of the courtroom right now you can see those barricades still up it's now nightfall and this has been the scene for uh geez over a week now yeah. of extra security people coming in and out of there well let's talk a little bit zach if we can about rico charges sure. now we know the district attorney fanny willis who defeated paul howard uh, back in 2020 has been really a, a, an expert on RICO charges. She employed it in 2015 against uh, the APS teachers in the midst of the cheating scandal and of course with the uh, Atlanta rapper Young Thug as well. And to sort of clarify, RICO charges, when you hear that term, it essentially means a group of individuals who are all united toward misadventure for putting it uh, in, in lack of legal terms. <laughs> I but think but that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, these RICO charges are the ones being used on, on Mr. Trump 
that maybe no one saw coming when this all began two years ago. I want to say just very quickly, we don't yet know for sure what charges were here, um, what this indictment says yet. I, I think we're in the process of obtaining a physical copy of that and actually reading through it. And as soon as we do and we've seen it, we can say for sure what charges are in there. But you're right, there's been a lot of sort of insinuation and suggestion and rumor that a RICO charge may be a component, maybe one of the key pillars of any indictment naming the former president, Donald Trump, as a defendant. You mentioned District Attorney Fonnie Willis has a, a pretty rich history in bringing RICO cases. They tend to be complicated. They tend to take a fair deal of time to investigate and get all your ducks in a row. And they can take a fair bit of time to prosecute and actually make their way through the court system, especially because one of the hallmarks is typically that RICO cases feature multiple defendants, sometimes many defendants. The Atlanta Public Schools cheating right. scandal, yep. I believe, had more than uh, 10 or 11. Um, and as we touch base on that, I think, Faith, you have another update for we us here. We do have a major update, you all. So we're learning, uh, NBC producer actually snapped a picture of the indictment, a cover of the front cover. You can see it right there. Um, what we're seeing is that there were 10 indictments presented, zero were no bills. So that's what we're seeing right now. Um, I wish we could, you know, zoom in and see what that says a little bit. But one, we are eventually going to get our hands on this, these papers so that we can go through and read to see exactly, you know, who's indicted, what the charges were. But once again, we are seeing that 10 indictments were handed up. And this is unlike what we've seen in the last three criminal cases against the former president, um, the criminal case in New York, an indictment against the former president, right. the criminal case in Mar-a-Lago right. against him, co-conspirators, the latest one with the DOJ against him. This one, 10 indictments. So it's going to be him plus, or excuse me, we don't know if it's going to be the former president, so let me not say that, but we, it's going to be 10 different people. So it, we're, this is going to be much different than we've seen in the last four cases. It, it certainly could be. Um, the, the, the closest, I guess, two parallels that come to mind, and it's hard to say a parallel because they're not maybe just close close cousins maybe of cases um, yeah. first the, the mar-a-lago case the documents case this is a federal case brought in florida there were uh former president donald trump was clearly the main defendant in that case but there were a few others who were also named in that case so there is some precedent for seeing a, a case with former president as a defendant and others being named as co-defendants as well yeah. but you're right the federal indictment jack smith's um i should should be clear which federal indictment we're talking about. Um, there were two of them, that's correct. There are in a state case out of New York, but that special counsel's case, the most recent one focusing on 2020 election, what they say was election interference, unlawful election interference, there were six folks who were named without naming them, I guess is the way to put it. They were unindicted co-conspirators. Many news organizations, ourselves included, have put together who many of those may have been, but in that case, it was only former President Donald Trump who was named here. We saw 10 indictments handed up. We saw Judge Robert McBurney take possession of them, read them, we presume, into the record, which is uh, a legal requirement here in the Georgia criminal justice system. The question now is who may be named? And I do want to point out that there was a lot of overlap that we saw in that recent DOJ case and some of the, uh, you know, accusations here in Georgia. I mean, I believe it was a tenth of that document. I believe it was 15 pages or so um, of mentions of Georgia in it. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see, you know, once we are able to see this indictment and what is in it what we see but right now i believe we're going to get out to doug richards you're taking live look at pictures outside of the courthouse and we do see doug here so doug lots of new information here we're hearing that an indictment is handed up doug can you hear us all right, right there is doug it looks like we're having a couple of problems but we will get back to him momentarily so if you are the legal representation of uh, former President Trump tonight, and these indictments do indeed come back, as we have seen uh, some of this evidence tonight, is this framed in a political context? Is that how you deal with this, at least initially, that 
there is a, a proverbial witch hunt out to get me. We saw a tweet today attacking former Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan today about describing him as failed. Uh, we also this is the president who was saying this. On just his that, that's correct. On truth and we also have heard from Rudy Giuliani tonight on one of our broadcasts where he was talking about the, com the, the political component because an election year is forthcoming. Donald Trump is the leading Republican uh, at this point, believes that it is all an effort to try and stop it. Is that what you anticipate seeing in the days ahead from his legal team? I, I would never presume to be the attorney for the former president or anybody else here, but I, I think it's a fair bet if, if we have to make an educated guess here. I think history has shown us that this is going to operate on a couple tracks. Um, there's going to be the political track, which you've got to imagine anybody who is a supporter of the former president, uh, his legal team included, but certainly the more partisan folks involved with his campaign apparatus, his personal office, his personal aides are going to do everything they can to frame this, like you said, Jeff, in a political context. Um, and we've seen it after the special counsel's indictment that was unsealed earlier this month, I, I believe it was on August 1st of this month, the Trump campaign came out very quickly and called it, like you said, a political witch hunt. I think yeah. that's a message we've heard a lot from the former president and his allies. I think we're going to hear it again. But then there is also the legal track that's yeah. happening here. Um, we've seen the beginning components of that tonight, and we're yeah. going to be continuing to follow it throughout the evening. We've seen a lot of stuff. We want to get out now to Doug Richards just to get his perspective on this. Once again, new information that 10 indictments yes. were handed up, zero were no built. So, Doug, yes. if you could hear us out yes. there, we know that you are live outside. We still see a lot of uh, police presence, a lot of security. So, Doug, what's your take on this? Well, it's fun to speculate about what the indictments are, are going to say. It is kind of pointless on the one hand, and on the other hand, it, uh, there will be abundant speculation until the moment that the indictments are presumably published on the website uh, of the clerk of the Superior Court. And I'm looking at my colleague, Rebecca Lindstrom, who is off camera over here, who was, you were in Judge McBurney's courtroom, right? Come chat with me for a moment, if you wouldn't mind, Rebecca Lindstrom, our investigative reporter. Uh, she was in uh, McBurney's courtroom. Mm -hmm. So um, you were expecting to learn what the indictment said, maybe, right? I mean, that's why all those people were in there. Yeah, I think that's why you had about 40, 50 reporters from across the country that were sitting inside there waiting to hear exactly what the indictments were going to be. And it really was a very simple and quick process once it started. They just came in, they asked if this was, uh, if the process went, you know, smoothly as expected. They said yes. He signed it, handed them back the stack of papers, and then were the they words, left. Were the words true bill ever uttered? Never, never. In fact, uh, we did ask when um, they had left, like if, if they could tell us anything about what was in the indictment, and uh, his only comment was just to sort of jokingly say, well, I didn't look at it that close. Um, like the most <laughs> the most profound indictment in this man's career. And, and yeah, he was not revealing anything in that moment, but he did hand it over and specifically said, you are taking this to the clerk's office. I am entrusting you to take it straight to the clerk's office. And uh, the woman nodded in agreement and then left the courtroom and that was it. I mean, really, so not at all what we were expecting. And so now we are all still waiting to find out exactly what was decided by these grand jurors. I can tell you that it was a pretty thick stack of, yeah. of papers. So it, was it wasn't familiar. just like one paper, two papers. It was it was a significant stack that was handed back and forth. And indictments generally don't have a lot of evidence in them that's mostly just each count mm -hmm. as a narrative, as like a two or three sentence narrative. Although we have seen with some of the other indictments that they've really broken down more kind of the arguments behind Okay. the the allegations so that could be the case here as well uh, since we know that outside of a press conference that we're hoping the district attorney is going to have tonight tomorrow at some point sort of explaining where we are at in this process and and what the indictments uh, actually include you know that that may also be her opportunity to sort of spell out and answer some of those questions as to the roadmap of where she's going with these charges we, we just don't know until we see them, but we have seen that in other cases and other indictments involving former President Trump. So we have indictments that have been returned. 
We don't know what's in the indictment. Somebody texted me just a few minutes ago and said, this is the most Atlanta thing I've ever seen. <laughs> well, I know that there was even some surprise as far as just what was going to happen with the timing of all of this, because we knew that there were a set number, I believe about 10 people, who we thought were going to appear before the grand jury. Right. The hour was getting late, and I think the question was asked, do they want to try to push through? And the decision was yes, so then they reached out to them to see if they really felt that they already had the information they needed to make a decision without hearing from the remaining witnesses and the decision was yes and so some of those witnesses at least one of those witnesses was dismissed before ever mm -hmm. speaking before the grand jury now we do know that that person spoke before the special grand jury the special purpose grand jury so you know, the grand jurors here were able to kind of receive that information that that witness would have shared had they been in there in person. But I guess they felt they didn't need to ask any additional questions of their own. They had the information they felt that they needed to go ahead and return these indictments. Okay. I think I heard a rap in my ear, which means that uh, <laughs> um, as edifying as you were, uh, we're going to uh, carry on with the rest of the newscast for the moment. Uh, thank you, Rebecca Lipstrom. Uh, live at the Fulton County Courthouse, Doug Richards. Fulton Live News. All right, Doug, thank you. We want to go a couple of minutes away from where you are standing right now to Joe Ripley, who has been there most of the evening and certainly has been a witness to the security ring around yeah. that area. And Joe, this has been going on a very long time. More than a week now, these streets have been blocked off. Yeah. Has this been the result of a tip of violence or an anticipation of the potentiality of it? Well, if you ask Fulton County Sheriff Patrick Labatt, he would just say, we need to be prepared for any and everything. Once indictments drop, once an arraignment uh, comes to pass, and we hear and see some of these defendants come to the Fulton County Courthouse. But as you can see here, it's pretty much been status quo for the last week, as you mentioned, we have heard throughout this summer that security would ramp up, and here we see it outside the Fulton County Courthouse. Here at the intersection of MLK and Pryor, you can see this portion of Pryor Street is blocked off. A perimeter of patrol vehicles from the Fulton County Sheriff's Office can be seen around the courthouse, just securing the area. It's an eventful Monday here. You've got up the street at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, a Beyonce concert, and down here at the courthouse, all eyes peeled, at least among us media members, on potential indictments here, uh, which we understand have been passed up to Judge McBurney. It's a matter at this point of what is in those indictments and who is named. We actually heard moments ago from independent journalist George Cheedy, who was one of the witnesses who testified uh, before the special purpose grand jury, was called to testify before the uh, regular grand jury, who had in their hands the responsibility of handing this indictment. Uh, and uh, we, we heard from him that that he was uh, that this was a victory for journalism. That's what George told us just moments ago. He said he did not testify before this grand jury, but was willing to do so. Was here for about four or five hours, came out. Uh, he said he was just waiting around, but the grand jury ultimately didn't need to hear from him. He said, though, that this could be a pivotal point in politics here in Georgia. This trial will bear that out. It will start, uh, of course, with these indictments uh, and then the entire legal process, which you heard Zach Merchant kind of unfold for you moments ago here in our newscast. George assumes he's not coming back. His role, of course, uh, tied to the uh, alternate elector scheme uh, that happened a couple of years back in December. George actually stumbled into uh, that meeting and observed what happened from there, was asked before the special grand jury you know, what he experienced there and his moments after, was called back today. We thought he would show up tomorrow, but that timeline was moved up, and that's why we're seeing this quick succession of events happening to where we expected indictments later on this week. It turns out the judge is going to read those indictments sometime tonight. So you can see here uh, the flashing lights. We expect at some point uh, either uh, someone from the DA's office or someone here, an official from Fulton County, to come down those steps and actually explain to us 
what has happened tonight. We will also give you a sneak peek inside the courtroom once uh, Judge McBurdy uh, gets those indictments read out to you. But for now, it's uh, still wait and see. We know a little bit more, Jeff and Faith, but as of this moment, we're still camped out here outside the Fulton County Courthouse. Pretty quiet, I would say, over the last hour or two. The only really uh, eventful thing happening was when witnesses like George or former Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan come out. We are on them, pounced on them to, to just sort of ask them some questions for what went on inside. All right, Joe, well, I have some news for you. You're going to need to hang in there just a little bit longer. We did just get new information that the DA is expected to give a press conference after the um, indictments are entered into the system. This could take anywhere from one to three hours, which means we could be in for a much longer night tonight, but we're going to have to wait and see. But right now, we do want to get out to Caitlin Ross, who is standing outside of the Fulton County Courthouse. Caitlin, I don't know if you're at the same entrance where all of the reporters evacuated in mass. <laughs> Rebecca was saying that there was between 40 to 50 reporters in the same room um, as Judge McBurney before he told them, okay, everybody leave. But what, what have you seen in the last, I guess, 30 minutes or so from where you are. So we have reporters stationed at just about every entry and exit of the Fulton County Courthouse. And what's tricky about this courthouse is you can get in and out a number of different ways. So we did see some of those reporters coming down, coming to speak with their crews. We're on the prior side street where they've completely shut down the street to car traffic. It's been closed for more than 48 hours now. Today, though, it got really busy. Dozens of crews from across the country here to report on exactly what happened. Rebecca Lindstrom inside the courtroom there saying there were crews from all over the country waiting in the courtroom for news and really they waited a very long time to be sent out. They said the courtroom was closing up, everybody had to leave, but not before seeing that cover sheet, that piece of paper saying 10 indictments had been returned, zero had been no belt. So that is what everybody out here is talking about, wondering what those 10 indictments are going to look like, what that paperwork is going to look like, and what we're doing right now is waiting for that to get entered into the system. So Judge Robert McBurney said that he saw that paper, he told our Nick Wooten inside the courtroom he didn't get a good look at exactly what it was and the clerk of court's office is entering that into the system right now just about an hour ago someone noted that the light was still on in the clerk's office so it's likely that we're going to get the paperwork tonight after we get that paperwork we're going to have a much better idea of what we're talking about outside right now there's a lot of speculation about what they could have talked about. The most concrete thing we have to go off of is independent journalist George Cheedy. He came out and really explained the process to us. He said he sat in that room, he talked about movies, they didn't talk about the case, but he was talking to the other witnesses who were called to testify today. Ultimately, he didn't end up being called. He said he was ready and willing to testify if he needed to, and he said he thought a lot about what this means for journalism. Was this a good thing that a journalist was not called in this case? or will it impact coverage of this case going forward? He said he's a political reporter, he's good at what he does, and he intends to keep doing that for a long time to come. And so he's the witness we heard the most from. We did hear a little bit from former Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan. He had some to say about the process and how important he thought it was to stand up there and testify today. But the other witnesses who were called really didn't say much of anything. They said they wanted to respect this process. They wanted to wait for the official word to come down. They thought it was important that that the court was able to do its job without them talking about what happened inside those doors. So now is the time we are going to hear what happened inside those doors. We're going to get the paperwork. We're going to be able to read through and analyze what it means. And then as Zach Merchant said earlier, begin this slow march to trial. Because after this comes out, you can only imagine the barrage of information we're going to be getting from both sides of this and see how it goes from here. So Faith and Jeff, this has been a long day, but it really is just the beginning and what this case is going to look like in Georgia and how it's going to look if the months, if not years to come. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting what, what really caught my attention as well. What you were saying tonight, Caitlin, is the fact that speculation has become rampant. It really is the cottage industry tonight. Everybody's speculating about what this means. Where do we go from here? What are the political ramifications? So much to consider, so much to ponder. 
But the hope, the wish, is that we will have the information about these possible indictments coming up, certainly in the minutes and the hours ahead. Caitlin Ross from downtown Atlanta will check with you uh, a little bit later. Now we're joined by attorney Robert James, a familiar figure around Atlanta Metro, the former DeKalb District Attorney. Mr. James, we appreciate you being with us tonight. And if you would give us uh, your view of what has transpired so far this evening. Well, it's my opinion. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, the DA's office has, you know, brought an indictment. There are probably multiple individuals involved, most likely uh, the former president of the United States. And um, but what we have to understand is that an indictment is not a conviction. It's just the beginning of the process. So um, so it's like poking the bear. You have to finish the fight. Um, and so, you know, there will be a fight coming. There will be trials coming. Uh, evidence will be presented. Um, and, and so there's there are miles to go before D.A. Fonnie Willis sleeps. Has taken two and a half years. Is, is that too long in your estimation? Do you believe the system must change in terms of grand juries and their relationship with jury trials? No, you take as long as you need. Um, because ultimately, as you know, the elected uh, Fulton County DA, um, she's the only person that's going to be held account held accountable if there's some sort of misstep. Um, so, you know, when you look at the nature of the evidence in this case, perhaps uh, you know there are several different things going on. You know, we've heard about you know we know about the phone call, we know about you know the voting machines up in Fulton County. You know, there's the alleged fake electors, and you know, God knows what else. Um, and so all of this has to be put into place um, and it could be complex. And so, you know, ultimately, you know, there's a saying that we used to use in our public integrity unit, and that's when you indict, be ready to fight. Um, and so there is no more investigation when you indict someone, you had better be prepared to prove it. Um, and if it takes two years, it takes two years. Charges and District Attorney Fannie Willis's expertise in these RICO charges, do RICO charges, and again, I'm, I'm gonna use a very simplistic definition of these for those who don't follow these kinds of things. Essentially, it is a group of people that are together, a team that are uniting toward a misadventure of some kind in the eyes of the court. Uh, does it make this case more difficult uh, with a former president? It makes it more complex. Uh, but in some ways, it makes it, I don't want to say easier um, to prove, but it makes it easier to present. Because ultimately, when you're presenting a RICO case, what you're doing is that you're pulling together a lot of different material. We call them predicate acts. Uh, you need at least two predicate acts in Georgia, two criminal acts in Georgia to be the basis of it. And you're saying that these acts, although seemingly unrelated, came together um, and advanced a, a scheme or an enterprise. Um, and so you know, it, it gives you more to prove, but you can tell the full story as opposed to just telling the story of one predicate act. You can tell the full story of how all of these crimes came together uh, to fill out, you know, a big picture. Um, and that's what that's what prosecutors in Georgia use RICO for and on the, and on the federal level. Mr. James, what, what should we be looking for now in the hours ahead and, and maybe even the days also? Yeah, well, one of the things I'm going to be looking at is um, when this indictment um, is made public, if the former president is in fact indicted, it's true bill, right? Um, you know, we know that there are a lot of things that have been alleged, you know, here in Georgia, not just a phone call, but like I say, the Coffee County incident and also the fake electors. I'm curious to see, you know, what evidence connects him directly to this information. You know, there's there's a legal threshold that has to be that has to be crossed, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have you don't necessarily need direct connection. It can be indirect. But practically, if you're indicting him and you're putting in front of citizens, you want direct connection. And so I'm curious to see what evidence there is. Attorney Robert James, Mr. James, thanks a lot for your time tonight, the former DeKalb District Attorney. We appreciate it, and I'm sure we'll be talking to you in the hours ahead. Thanks again. All right, you just heard him speak about these RICO charges. I want to get back to our Zach Merchant to kind of expand on that. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about potential RICO charges. One. Um, facet of these charges means that if the RICO charges are brought, that means that you could actually see some elements of charges from outside of Fulton County. That kind of opens up the door for that. Also, you're looking at potentially more than one person. Um, as we, a lot of us are familiar with the YSL case that's going on right now, and we saw a, a large amount of people 
Escobar involved in that. Um, you were speaking about the APS case that Bonnie Willis tried way back when, but mm -hmm. now we're looking at this potential, um, or excuse me, these confirmed indictments, we just don't know the charges yet that we are expecting. So Zach, can you expand a little bit for the folks at home, what would the significance of a RICO case be here? It's a good question. I think it has a lot of different answers. The, the first is this. A RICO charge, like you mentioned, gives a prosecutor a, a much broader reach in what they can prosecute than what is uh, common for them. It lets them reach out of their jurisdictional boundary if they can prove that a case, or rather an element of their case that happened outside of the, the county where they are situated is connected to the RICO case at large. Um, I actually, I want to run through quickly because it ties into something we've been talking about earlier today. I want to run through the elements of a RICO case. We just heard it in sort of broad strokes, but I think it's worthwhile to dive into the details on this a little bit. This is a moment that we're in. Um, it's a precedent-setting precedent moment. We've seen three indictments around the country at this point naming former President Donald Trump as a defendant. We do not know if the former president is named as a defendant in these indictments, these 10 indictments that we've seen handed down today, but we will learn more in the coming hours, and signs suggest that there is a good likelihood the former president may indeed be named as one of the defendants here. And I think the best way for us to move forward and move through it, and really the only way to get through it is to dig in and lean into these details. So this is the Georgia RICO statute's three elements that a prosecutor needs to prove. First, they've got to prove that there was some sort of enterprise that existed. Second, they've got to show that the wording here is a pattern of racketeering activity existed. And to do that, uh, you need to prove, a prosecutor needs to prove two predicate crimes, two qualifying crimes. That can include things like forgery, false statements, perjury, computer crimes, influencing witnesses, and a slew of others. And finally, a prosecutor needs to show that the defendant, whoever is named, and there could and likely will be many, was a part of that enterprise. And I say all this because you might remember earlier today and throughout the evening, we've been talking about this, how to put it, this report that was published by the wire service, Reuters. Um, 11 Alive can't independently confirm this, but the report from Reuters said that there was a document posted to the Fulton County Court's website that showed the former president facing more than a dozen criminal charges. We do not know if that document is legit or not. The clerk of the county court says that it is not. They said it is fictitious. We also want to note, though, that the formatting of that document that Reuters published and wrote on seems to match the typical formatting for other standard Fulton County Court documents. But perhaps of most interest right now, and again, we don't know if this document is, is real or not, if it is this document, I have it here, um, it shows in this list of potential charges against the former president. Essentially, again, it looks like a leak. Maybe. Again, it's yeah. hard to say. It could be. But some of the same predicate crimes that are in the RICO statute are also named in this document that may or may not be real. So this is sort of where we're at right now. Yeah. So this is state level election interference, which means uh, maybe most importantly for the public is they will be able to see the evidence and they will be able to see Mr. Trump and they will be able to see his allies f uh, and, and the charges that they now in all probability will be facing. If whoever is named right in these indictments, yes. And, and I think that's one of, especially in the climate that we find ourselves in, no matter how you feel about the former president or the political situation we all are in as a country. and. No matter how you feel, no matter what party, what uh, orientation you have politically, I think everybody feels like this has been a long past few years and a long many years here, a lot of stress, a lot of controversy. And it's just beginning. In all likelihood, ways. it may be. One of the benefits, if there is such a thing, um, of whatever may happen next is that anything that happens is going to happen in open court. And in Georgia, in all likelihood, it's also going to happen in front of cameras, yeah. probably on video cameras. So everybody can watch. Everybody can see the evidence presented and hopefully make up their own minds. The federal government doesn't like to do that. No. Um, it should be noted that uh, a coalition of 
First Amendment advocates uh, has been pushing for a long time to get camera access into federal courts. The Supreme Court recently, um, during the COVID years, started allowing simultaneous live streaming of audio, which was a big deal at the Supreme Court level. But you're right, typically in federal courts, no cameras allowed, print, I should say still, or video camera, and that's why you see the, the, cart the, the cartoon, the sketches so frequently. You were at Georgetown Law. I would think that fellow students of your generation were highly supportive of all of these courtrooms being televised. Mm -hmm. I would guess those closer to my age might not necessarily have been in favor of that. Am I correct? It's hard to say. I don't want to. I don't want to <laughs> be. I don't want to be an avatar for any generation here. Um, I think, without getting too into the legal weeds, at first blush, it sounds like, of course, you certainly want cameras in every courtroom. It's uh, a check on power. It's a way for the public to watch. When, in a lot of ways, the government is exercising its maximum possible power. This is a place where folks can have years of their lives sentenced to be spent behind bars, potentially their entire life spent behind bars. The stakes are incredibly high, and of course, you would want cameras in there. And I think that's how I feel about it as well. But federal judges and some federal attorneys, uh, attorneys who practice in federal courts frequently would say that when you put cameras into the courtroom, you risk taking the focus away from purely the evidence, purely the testimony, and now all of a sudden attorneys and witnesses and judges have to also worry about what's happening outside of the court. You hear the O.J. Simpson trial come up right. frequently as a sort of example of what federal courts want to avoid. And, and in some ways you can see the case being made by federal judges that this is to make them make sure as best they can that the case gets done right. So here's what I'm hearing from you, correct me if I'm wrong, Please. that this will, this is a very political issue to begin with, but television has the potential to throw gasoline onto this fire. Or water. That's the thing, right? Um, you know, uh, sunshine is the best disinfectant. And I think that I don't want to say how I feel, I don't want to you know, express opinions here, but I think there are folks who would say that the best thing, especially in a highly politicized environment, is let the evidence speak for itself. It's a cornerstone bedrock of our justice system writ large, and being able to see what's happening inside of our courts, inside of our Georgia courts, mm -hmm. uh, I think is going to be yet another reason why the rest of the country sits up and takes notice to what's happening here in our state and in a lot of ways another big point to show that Georgia is perhaps the center of political gravity in the country. It really is and I, I want to ask you something I'm glad that you spoke about that because a lot of people have been taking notice I mean we've been online on social media all day people asking questions leading up to this and I want to talk to you about first of all for our viewers we didn't all go to law school, so some people might not understand, you know, the difference between the special purpose grand jury that did an eight-month investigation who saw some of the same people, former Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan, B. Wynn, Jen Jordan, George Cheedy. They already spoke, but then they were subpoenaed again to speak today. So could you just kind of break down what the significance of that and why did they need to do that? I, I, it's hard to say a little bit with... with uh, great specificity unless and until we hear from District Attorney Fonnie Willis, which I think we will in the coming hours here, that's definitely going to be a question that we ask and I, I think we should get an answer to. Generally speaking, a special purpose grand jury, they're fairly rare in the state of Georgia. They are convened to investigate one particular matter. This yeah. one, as you said, it took months investigating yeah. the 2020 presidential election and efforts to reverse the results here in Georgia. Special purpose grand juries, while they can investigate, they don't have indictment power. Yeah. They can write a report suggesting indictments or not, it's mm -hmm. up to them, but they can't actually indict. They can't return what's known as a true bill, meaning that the grand jury believes there's probable cause that a crime actually was committed. And so you don't need to convene a special purpose grand jury as a prosecutor, but if you do, in the state of Georgia, it becomes sort of a two-step dance. Yeah. The special purpose grand jury serves an investigative function, but then the prosecutor has to take evidence to a regular grand jury. This is a, a, a very common, you know, every criminal court in the country has grand juries sitting for a session, um, and the prosecutor has to take that evidence, bring it to them, and then it's up to the regular grand jury to return an indictment or not. You know, with the proliferation of television cameras in courtrooms and 
uh, movies and television, I think we all see ourselves as sort of small town barristers of sorts, that we understand a little bit about what transpires and what goes on in courtrooms. That's not the case with grand juries. They r remain a mystery, a yeah. riddle, and an enigma to most that we don't quite have the same familiarity with it. We don't know how it works. It does not infer innocence or guilt. It merely throws out the information that perhaps something is there and it should be you know, found in a courtroom. Generally speaking, I'd say that's right. I, I would say it's more than just sort of merely throwing out that there's a chance something happened. Uh, we've talked about this earlier, I've said it, the burden of proof required for a grand jury to return an indictment much, much, much lower than what is required for a criminal jury at trial to convict. That is true. That said, a grand jury still has to come to the conclusion, a majority of the citizens on that grand jury need to come to the conclusion that there is probable cause that a crime was committed. So that's you know, at least more than 50% certainty. Certainly a lower bar than what's required at trial, but uh, it's not nothing by any means. It's a significant milestone, and I think this is a good moment just to say as well that yeah. even though the former president is now currently facing three indictments in three cases around the country, we don't know if he's named in an indictment here in Fulton County. We don't know. We're going to read those indictments and see what it says. Yeah. This is still precedent setting for us here in Atlanta. It's precedent setting for the metro, for the state, and for the country. This yeah. is a big, no matter what happens later tonight, as soon as we get our hands on this indictment, this is a very significant moment. Absolutely. Well, Zach, thank you so much for that insight and information. Look, we didn't all go to law school, but Zach did. And we're very happy that he did. To we're it down we are for us. very we're <laughs> pleased as punch to use an old political term that you're here tonight. And if you didn't know, he just joined our team not too long ago. So thank you so well, much. For happy to be back here. That. Well, right now, uh, someone we were just talking about, George Cheedy, he is speaking with our Jennifer Bellamy live outside of the courthouse right now. We did hear from him briefly uh, about to say about an hour ago when he said that, you know what, I'm my testimony is not needed right now. So Jennifer, can you talk to him a little bit about what he witnessed today in the courtroom? I see him peeking in there. Hi, George. How you doing? You see him here. <laughs> you see him here. He's ready. He's had a long day. They're asking how you are today because you we know I'm you've fine. We know you've had a fine. <laughs> we know you've had a long day. Talk to us a little bit about what you can tell us about what you experienced today in there during that grand jury proceeding. I experienced not much. Actually, I went in at four o'clock. Uh, I wasn't expecting to be here today. In fact, I have Oppenheimer tickets, like the good one in Buford at the IMAX with 70 millimeter for 11.15 because I thought, like, how could they screw up at 11.15 showing at night on a Monday? Like, here I am. Uh, they called me early. I went in at 4 o'clock and I sat until about, like, a quarter of 9. We know with politics, it's often a lot of hurry up and wait, but we also know that you stumbled into that, that group, that meeting of the alternate or fake electors. So I know that that was part of what your, your testimony or what they wanted to hear from you about today. Yes, although I will take exception to the term stumbled. Okay. Uh, and I say that because I was in a room full of other journalists, some of whom are here, uh, but I was the person who noticed that one of the Republican electors was wa walking around like somebody who would have been an elector had Donald Trump won the state. Uh, this is a person that I had known since he was a child, um, but he wouldn't make eye contact with me. He was behaving strangely. And because of that, I had an instinct to follow him into a room with a camera going. And that's when I found the so-called fake electors doing their thing. And then they threw me out. What was so important for you about being here today and also sharing your observations and your experiences today? I know you've been speaking to a lot of reporters. What, what, what is important for you about being in that space and being able to tell what you saw and experienced? So one, it is an extremely unusual and fraught thing for any journalist to be called in front of a grand jury. We are not agents of the government. We are adversaries. We have to be willing to challenge power. The only reason I'm here is because the stakes are what they are, uh, because I think democracy is at stake. Um, and if it was for anything less than that, then I'd be in an abandoned missile silo in Montana someplace. You know, this would not be happening. Um, I think I had a, a small piece of the puzzle, um, and maybe not a necessary one. 
Uh, and that's fine. And it's probably a good thing that I didn't have to testify because the big journalism questions about coercion don't have to be raised. I think we're fine now. Um, but I think it speaks to just how damaged our democracy is. Like we are right at the edge of losing our democracy uh, because we haven't figured out how to resolve political problems like adults, like in courtrooms or at ballot boxes. And I fear uh, that this country will descend into a sort of Northern Ireland state of faction unless we sort this out. I know you have plans, so I want to ask you one final question. What do you think the folks, our viewers at home, who have been following along with this process, maybe some more closely than others, maybe some are just kind of cluing in in these moments, what do you think people at home should know about this process and what's going on here in Fulton County? So, one, um, we live in a very striated city. I was on the train this morning getting, or this afternoon coming here, and there was a guy who recognized me for nothing about this. They were looking at me because I'm uh, doing a podcast about the YSL trial and the Young Thug case. Um, two Atlantas, one that cares about this and one that honestly doesn't. Um, this is important, this is objectively important, but I think we lose sight of how many other problems there are in American society that we don't give this kind of attention to. And that's the kind of journalism I wanna practice, is to make people look at those things. Because there's no shortage of coverage of this. I have never seen anything like this in my life. I got attacked like wolves as I came out of the building. But, um, uh, some person is going to be murdered in Atlanta in the next week and there will be one news reporter who shows up and says something and then they'll everybody will disappear and nobody will care and that's as much a tragedy as anything that we're talking about well thank you so much we appreciate your time tonight and your perspective and you sharing your experiences with our audience this evening we thank you so much we're gonna send it back to you guys in the studio okay all right, Jennifer and George Chitty, thank you from downtown Atlanta. If you are just joining us, we are awaiting the grand jury's decision on potential indictments into the investigation into attempts to overturn Georgia's 2020 election results. Yeah, the indictments were just delivered to Judge Robert McBurney. You're seeing video of that. He's a Fulton County Superior Court judge who has been leading this investigation. We know that there are 10 indictments, but right now we don't know exactly who is being indicted. But here's a closer look at the indictments returned from the special grand jury. Today's date is written on those documents. And again, it says that there are 10 indictments. And now that we know a decision that was reached, let's talk about what happens next. First, the district attorney's office plans to hold a news conference with the details of the grand jury recommendations to indict. And we are told that could occur in the next one to three hours. That's likely when we get the list of who is on that list and what the charges may be forthcoming. After the announcement, the next step is the arraignment process. Arraignments will happen inside the Fulton County Courthouse for anybody charged with a crime. The Georgia election probe defendants will appear before a judge shortly after the indictments are then issued. They will hear the charges against them read aloud. Each one will enter a plea of guilty, not guilty, or no low, which means no contest. And this could happen within a few days, maybe up to a week, depending on how many defendants and where those people may live. So each defendant will also go through a booking process. Here, each of the defendants will likely be booked at either the courthouse or more traditionally at the Fulton County Jail. Booking will likely involve fingerprints and a mugshot. Sheriff Pat Labatt said that he is going to treat these defendants like any other defendants in Fulton County. Now, because these are nonviolent charges, chances are good most will be released from custody or on some form of bond. We want to go downtown right now. John Shirick is standing by. He has more information. We have seen him in the middle of, of uh, the gaggle of reporters that were interviewing George Cheedy about an hour and a half ago. John, where are you right now and what kind of information can, can you uh, share with us? We are at one end of a long row of reporters from all over the country and all over Georgia and all over Atlanta. We are waiting with everyone else to find out what the information is going to be coming from District Attorney Fonnie Willis inside. So there are news crews outside who are, have been waiting to uh, talk with witnesses as they left throughout the afternoon and evening. And then there are reporters inside waiting for the District Attorney Fonnie Willis to tell us what's going to happen next and what those indictments are going to be and when they're going to be released 
to the public so we'll know exactly who has been indicted and what those charges are. So this is uh, really a sort of a lull before what's next as we all await uh, to find out exactly what these charges are and who's being indicted, Jeff and Faye. John Shirick reporting for us. John, thank you. We appreciate it as always as we continue uh, to wait for the next couple of hours to see yeah. the indictments as they are unsealed. We will find out more information. But again, this whole process yeah. has been a long and winding road that has gone on for about two and a half years. So another two and a half to three hours is no big deal, right? I was going to say, <laughs> it's been a waiting game, a waiting game. And like we know, I mean, yeah. District Attorney Fannie Willis, she was elected in 2020. She started her appointment in 2021. And shortly after starting her appointment, that's when she launched this investigation. A big part of what led to the com uh, investigation was the infamous phone call, the 11,780 votes. Yeah, as you mentioned, it was almost her first day on the job that she dealt yeah. with that. Uh, she was uh, uh, ran a very successful campaign for district attorney and didn't have any problems whatsoever as far as being elected to the office. And she has been very active in the office that uh, she inherited from Paul Howard after defeating him soundly. Uh, she has been active on the gang front, yeah. active on the Trump front, and she has had a very high profile here uh, in the city that oftentimes Paul Howard did not have. And I want to get your insight on this, Jeff, because you've been reporting in this town for a very long time. What is your take on D.A. Willis's? I mean, from hearing from reports, even beyond Georgia, her um, attitude is tough on crime, and that's what people say. She's a tough fighter. She's a tough cookie. Is that prevalent through her previous um, cases. You know, I, I think we first got to know her in 2015 when she used these RICO charges on the cheating scandal inside the Atlanta Public Schools, yeah. which was an unbelievably story, uh, an unbelievable story of tragedy around here, how it's impacted so many thousands of kids who may never catch up. It may impact their ability to succeed in life. It was a very ugly story around here, and, and hopefully we will not see that happen again. But uh, that's where I think we first learned about her yeah. and her expertise with RICO charges. It's going to be really interesting to see. And I mean, just speaking on the waiting game, you had before the grand jury, you had a special purpose grand jury that sat for eight months. They spoke with 75 different witnesses. Some of those same witnesses we saw walk in and out of the courthouse this morning. So this has been a long time coming. Um, and some folks, I mean, our Teresa Bowles actually caught up with D.A. Willis at a back to school event recently. And she said, we're prepared for this. We're ready for this. Um, so it looks like that she could be ready. Those indictments, 10 indictments have, we can confirm that there are 10. We don't know who's indicted yet. We're waiting for that. But like you said, two or three hours. What, what's two or three hours? Well, we've talked with Zach Merchant also about this, that we are in sort of an unknown world of the political ramifications of this as we have an election year coming upon us. What does it mean? One side will see this as, yeah. uh, as perhaps a, a, a wolf hunt. Uh, the other side will see it as, uh, the, the, you know, the issue of law. So we've seen that a lot. De depending yeah. on what your political perspective, uh, yeah. it probably is how you will uh, you will frame this. And she did mention in an email that she sent to her um, staff, there was a uh, campaign video, uh, and her name was mentioned. And we did see an email that was sent to her staff, and she basically said, "Do not respond. We are not going to be a part of this. We are going to be impartial." And so, perhaps her words will show up in whatever these indictments or charges. But like it or not, she is a part of it. Yeah. A big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're going to go to Joe Ripley right now, who is uh, in downtown Atlanta. Joe, it's all yours for the very latest dose of information, please. Yeah, so we understand that in probably a little less than three hours, we should know what these indictments say. We should know who is being charged and with in connection with Georgia's 2020 election, an election that has been under contention for several years now. You mentioned Georgia as the political center, it seems like, of the South, at the very least, if not the entire country, making history in 2020, making history in 2021. Here we are in 2023, and yet more history to be made here tonight. You can see the security measures that have been in place for much of the last week or so. Fulton County Sheriff's deputies have been posted outside, either in patrol vehicles, walking around. We've seen canine units 
some deputies facing our way, some facing the courthouse. When it comes to securing this perimeter, this is their utmost priority. We've seen just a couple of protesters out here for what it's worth, uh, the bulk of uh, whom are supportive of D.A. Willis's investigation into Georgia's 2020 election. They want the truth to come out. They want a jury of their peers to uh, try this case. And uh, we've heard it from several witnesses, including former Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan, let the American people People decide. Let Americans learn what truly happened in this election, this election that has been talked about year after year up to this point. You have a uh, potential uh, former president under indictment here in Atlanta. Uh, we are still waiting to, to hear and, and learn if, in fact, former President Trump does face charges here. But he is the front runner. Let us remind you in the GOP uh, nomination race for 2024. It seems like in every poll that he and current President Joe Biden are kind of neck and neck or, or split. And so what does this indictment, what will the preceding uh, arraignment do uh, for President Trump, former President Trump's chances in 2024? We'll have to wait and see. Security wise, we understand that local, state and federal law enforcement are working in conjunction to try and uh, keep these proceedings as safe and secure as possible, noting that witnesses have been going in and out. Um, you got to keep them protected, as well as the jurors tasked and charged with, um, you know, this case, this responsibility. Uh, they're hearing this case. They're hearing several others here in the Atlanta area. And so keeping their safety uh, top of mind, that's what the Fulton County Sheriff's Office is charged with doing. We've heard throughout the summer, we've heard uh, Patrick Labatt, the sheriff here in Fulton County, he sent uh, deputies down to Miami. He sent deputies up to Washington, D.C. and to New York, where former President Trump is, has, been facing, uh, has been facing charges, has been indicted previously uh, up until this point to try and learn just how to secure this perimeter, how to keep this courthouse area safe. And the real test, I would argue, has not even begun. Just wait until we learn who these defendants are in this indictment that has been returned to Judge McBurney. Once we find that out in a matter of hours, we will understand when they will be coming here. They will have to be uh, processed here in the Fulton County Courthouse, uh, much like you have seen in our, our special coverage uh, leading into today. Um, what will this area look like? Atlanta can be a very charged city. They can be a very passionate city. We have seen that, especially when it comes to political matters. How will we see law enforcement respond? They've gotten a plan together. How well that plan holds up, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Joey, I think my question for you has to do with security. Do you, do you see any potential protesters anywhere near this ring of intense security, really, that has been going on now for about 10 days around that area? You know, it's a little surprising. We haven't seen that many protesters, Jeff, and none who have been belligerent or angry or demonstrative. They're simply here to, to show up, make their voices heard. We've seen a couple of signs here. Um, very peaceful, uh, as I think one of the witnesses, George Chidi, is finally headed home here. But uh, that's why I, I pose to you this, Jeff. What will this look like here in a few days when maybe people start to learn what these indictments are, who's listed in them? Um, is it fair in their eyes that they are being charged? Is this politically motivated? We heard from George, uh, former Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan before. We've heard from Gabe Sterling and the Secretary of State's office. They're concerned and in some cases worried that violence may crop up. We have not seen that yet, but the political divide is, is very stark right now. So we'll have to see how these proceedings from this night forward add to that division or possibly, you know, if, if law enforcement is here to try and keep that peace and keep that divide from getting even deeper. You know, Joe, you've been covering this for a while now. As you have spoken with law enforcement, have there been any implied threats from groups who might want to disrupt the proceedings? We learned, Jeff, a couple of weeks ago that there have been threats what Fulton County Sheriff Pat Labatt calls credible threats against him, against D.A. Willis, against their respective entities. This is a case that 
has brought out, unfortunately, the, the worst in some people. And so as a result, some of these entities, like the sheriff, like DA Wells, have had to have extra security. They've gotten letters, they've gotten texts and phone calls. We have learned from a press conference just the other day that this case stoked. And so at the moment, it seems very peaceful out here. It seems as though those threats are under control um, and, and that there's no imminent threat to folks out here, the general public we've seen walking by, driving by, concert goers, uh, folks just generally curious about what's going on out here at the courthouse. But they seem safe. They they seem like, you know, they're just going about their business. That's how we feel tonight. We've got a, a row of reporters behind us who have been nothing but kind. Uh, and, and so have the law enforcement, I might add, who have spent hours out here themselves trying to secure this scene and the perimeter, uh, a lot of whom say it's a, it's a fluid situation. We saw earlier this morning when law enforcement had to uh, confront a group of protesters in a separate matter, but they are ready. They are, are willing to step in as needed. And so, Jeff, security around the courthouse is ramped up already. It'll probably be like that for a while, I suspect. All right, Joe Ripley from downtown Atlanta reporting for us all night. Thanks for your good work, Joe. We always appreciate it. Thank you so much, Joe. Okay, so we want to bring you guys an update. About 9.58, so just about five minutes ago, we did receive a statement from the Trump campaign. Keep in mind, we do know that 10 indictments have been handed up. We do not know who is yet indicted. However, this statement from the Trump campaign, they are calling out uh, District Attorney Fonnie Willis, calling her a radical Democrat. Uh, part of the statement says they could have brought this two and a half years ago, yet they choose to do this for election interference reasons in the middle of President Trump's successful campaign. They go on to say that this is a legal dumb, double standard set against President Trump and it must end. So they seemingly are responding to an indictment, but once again, we don't know yet if the president is mentioned in these indictments. We should learn that in the next hopefully less than three hours here with a press conference from D.A. Fonnie Willis's office. But right now we want to get to our Rebecca Lindstrom. She was actually inside of the courtroom that you all saw when that big stack of papers was being handed to Judge Robert McBurney. And then, Rebecca, uh, per your reporting, you all were asked to leave. So can you paint a picture for us, if you will, beyond, I know you guys had to wait for a little bit, and then he finally entered the courtroom. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this really has been a waiting game throughout the day, really for for everyone, not just the media. We have been in and out of the courtroom just trying to get an assessment of what's going on with the grand jurors throughout the day. And what we have determined was around 7 o'clock, they were trying to decide if they were going to keep going and um, try to continue this tomorrow or, you know, they really had to make that decision. And so we were sort of on a standby. Is this going to wrap up in about an hour? We're all going to go home and then we'll come back tomorrow to see what the grand jurors have decided. Or do they really feel like they have enough information to make a decision now? And what we saw then around 844 when Judge McBurney came back into the courtroom was that they indeed had decided that they had enough information to go ahead and make that decision. In that courtroom was Sheriff Labatt. He was joined with two deputies, at least two deputies. There were three other men that were standing along the wall. We have yet to identify exactly their role at this time, but they did appear to be standing on guard, just sort of looking out amongst the media to make sure that there weren't any problems. And the only people who walked into that room then were the Fulton County Superior Court uh, clerk, Alexander, uh, excuse me, Shea Alexander, and then a member of the district attorney's office. They came in with the indictments. They handed it to Judge McBurney. He flipped through some of the pages. He asked just a few very simple questions, wanting to know, did the process go as they expected? Did everything go all right? They received an affirmative answer. And at that point in time, he signed those indictments and then handed it back to the court clerk saying I am handing these back to you to take and to process and to make sure that they get where they need to be. All of that, all of that waiting throughout the day came down to about two minutes. That was it, just two minutes from the time the papers came into the courtroom to when he signed them and they left the courtroom. I can tell you a lot of us were really expecting that we were going to get more information about what was in those indictments at that point in time, but 
it just didn't happen. And even when some of the media tried to nudge, ask, see if they could get a little bit of information, uh, Judge McBurney just sort of uh, jokingly said, uh, well, you know, I didn't look at them that closely. And he made it very clear that he was not giving up any information on what was inside those that we were going to have to wait until they were officially filed with the clerk's office. And then the district attorney had a chance to explain more about her process and the indictments that she was seeking. So that was sort of the feel inside the courtroom is for why we had to leave. I think it's just for security reasons. Uh, they were deciding that they needed to go ahead and lock up that courtroom. And in order to do that, the deputies couldn't leave until everyone was out of the courtroom. So at that point in time, they just asked everyone to leave so that they could go ahead and lock up the courtroom. There didn't seem to be much more to it than that. Uh, we do know that if you need to go in and out, you probably can, but not for any official business. What was interesting, I, I do want to just throw in, is that we already knew that the magistrate hearings were going virtual. We know that the district attorney's office had, you know, already warned the judges that most of their staff were going to be working remotely. So there wasn't a lot of court activity happening. But around five, six o'clock at night, as even staff who were inside the building started to leave, the hallways just got eerily quiet for this courthouse. I mean, this is probably the busiest courthouse in the state of Georgia. And to have the hallways be virtually empty, minus a a couple dozen reporters felt certainly a bit strange. And I'll apologize, I did have to pop this out because we were having a little bit of interference, but I'm gonna put it back in in case you had any questions that you wanted to ask at this point in time. Back to you. Rebecca, Judge McBurney is a very familiar figure in these here parts. He was appointed in 2012 by former Governor Nathan Deal, and Judge McBurney did his undergrad at Harvard and also Harvard Law School. A familiar figure around here, I think about him, with uh, the battle with the King family over the possessions of Dr. King, uh, also the abortion law that, that was uh, at issue involving uh, Governor Kemp. So we do know him well. We have seen a lot of his work over the years on television as uh, he has had a very strong presence here in our city and certainly is now presiding over one of the most famous nights that we have had in a very long time. Uh, around North Georgia and in the state of Georgia for that matter. We want to go back to downtown Atlanta right now. Doug Richards is standing by where he has been all evening long. Let's bring him in now. And Doug, what have you uh, been able to gather here since the last time we chatted? Doug is very quiet tonight for the most part, but we will check. Doug's been very busy out there. <laughs> Doug has been very busy. We will check in with him momentarily it when we like get him all set. There he is. It looks like he's Doug, can you hear us? Yeah, it always takes two tosses to me to, uh, <laughs> to actually get me. Doug, I've been working with TV. you for almost 40 years. I know that. I, I do know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've. Um, yeah, I, you know, what you said about Judge McBurney is interesting in that, uh, like you said, he was a Republican appointee. He is presumably going to be the trial judge in this case if and when there is a trial. And if I had to guess as to why he did not make an announcement from the bench as to what the indictment was, it would be that he didn't want to appear on camera to be the guy announcing that the former president of the United States uh, had been indicted. He's a neutral character, and in the other indictments, the federal indictments that have come out of Miami and New York, we've tended to hear from prosecutors. And in this case, um, having McBurney read it, I'm sure seemed very, seemed very awkward for him, and probably given his status as the potential trial judge in this case, as the likely trial judge in this case, um, he just didn't want to be that guy that's going to be on the news between now and tomorrow reading that indictment. I haven't talked to him, and I'm not saying that's actually the case, but it's one, certainly one possibility. Another possibility, another thing to consider here is, you know, as we said, McBurney is a Republican appointee. All of the appellate judges are Republican appointees. These are the state appellate judges who would hear appeals that the Trump campaign, presumably, or the Trump's lawyers, the President Trump's lawyers would file uh, if they objected to anything. Uh, the Supreme Court of Georgia is chock full of Republican appointees. And um, 
So if this case, you know, goes sideways for the former president and he wants to appeal this case, those are the courts that he has to appeal to. It's not the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, likewise, you know, the whole business, as, as we've seen uh, some protesters say, you know, there's no, he, he, the former president in a federal case, if he were convicted of something, could potentially pardon himself. Uh, in the great state of Georgia, the former president would not be able to, the former president slash maybe newly elected president again in 2024 would not be able to pardon himself. Again, I'm getting ahead of myself, but, but these are significant considerations given the fact that this would be, if in fact this is what happened, uh, a Republican president getting indicted in a Republican state with Republican officials not only running the mechanism of the judiciary, but also Republican officials being, in some cases, some of the uh, star witnesses against uh, the former president. And so while there will be complaints of unfairness, um, it would be a whole lot different if this was a Democratic state. Thank you. We appreciate it. I'm glad we were able to get you all linked up and set and ready to go. We appreciate the information and the wisdom as always. Even if it takes two <laughs> tosses. That's right. And probably right. a lot more. All right. Yep. So we want to catch you guys up. It's been a long day. It is 10 o'clock and we are not done yet. So we hope that you are hanging in there with us because we are excited to bring you the information as we get it. But let's start off from early this morning. When the courthouse opened up, uh, we saw a lot of movement from inside and outside of the courthouse after a relatively quiet week last week. We knew that Grand Jury A was going to be hearing some, um, some uh, information in this case, and we know that because of some people that we were seeing coming in and out of the courtroom. We spotted B. Wynn. She's a former state house rep. We saw Jen Jordan come in. She's a former state senate rep. Wynn confirming her camp confirming to us through a statement that she did indeed testify this morning. Jordan, actually, uh, Doug, who you just saw there, he was able to whip out a cell phone, talk to her for a few seconds, and she described her testimony. We also saw Gabe Sterling. He is with the Secretary of State's office, and I saw reports that he gave an hours-long testimony today. Uh, we also saw some Cop City protests. Cop City is not related <laughs> to this, um, these charges, but we did see some folks, and if you all are familiar with Cop City, if you're not, it is a Atlanta Public Safety Training Center, and so we did see some protests out there for that. Uh, just before 1 p.m., we did see a publish uh, what we cannot confirm is true or if they are actually charges, but Reuters published some what looked like some charges from this indictment before the indictment was handed up. They deleted it. Fulton Courts later released a statement saying that this document was fictitious. Trump lawyers Drew Finling and Jennifer Little issued a statement saying this was not an administrative mistake, referring to that case number and the judge's name. Around 3.30, uh, sources told NBC that they heard, the jury heard, five out of ten planned witnesses. Uh, at 5 o'clock, 5.05, we see that the court is still open. The courthouse is still open. It's supposed to shut down at 5 o'clock. That's when we knew, okay, we might be here for a long night. Um, and then we were waiting on um, George Cheedy, who you saw our Jennifer Bellamy speak to, that he gave testimony in the special purpose grand jury. He was subpoenaed to give a testimony in this grand jury. He did not. Uh, he was supposed to be one of those 10 witnesses, but former Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan did give testimony. So that is where we are right now. We know that 10 indictments were handed up. We know that the DA is expected to give a press conference at some point, uh, and that is what we're waiting Waiting for, and now we're going to go to John Shirek, who is actually in that scrum with George Cheedy that we saw a little earlier today. So, John, you're outside of the courthouse. We know that there's a lot of motion. Everybody's in this waiting pattern. Uh, what what are you hearing right now? One of the grand jury witnesses who was excused before he even testified, as you mentioned, was Atlanta journalist George Cheedy. And here is some video of Cheedy that we recorded about an hour ago as he left the Fulton County Courthouse. Cheedy was ready to tell the grand jury about that day when he walked in on a meeting of Republican Party activists at the state capitol. That was in December 2020, only to find out later that the people who were meeting were the Georgia GOP's so-called alternate electors, or 
fake electors who are preparing to take over, if you will. They were Trump supporters who were trying to, try to represent Georgia in the Electoral College vote in Washington instead of the Democrats. Issue. All right, John, yep. thank you so much for that insight. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting perspective to see what exactly is going on. And just the big question of the night, when are we going to find out who's indicted and what these charges are? Well, the expectation is that it will take a number of hours yet. Uh, again, we do not know an official timetable, but it was about 90 minutes ago that we heard that it could be as much as three hours. So we simply will wait here and we will continue to sort of take a look at some of the evidence, some of the information that we know how it is playing out legally and certainly and how it is playing out politically so there yeah. are, are two major dynamics here at work and that is the law side the legal side and the politics as we get ready for an election year mm -hmm. and that is the wild card in all of this those who are supporters of uh, former President Trump they believe this is a witch hunt they believe that their candidate is being framed those who do not care for Mr. Trump believe that the rule of law must be adhered to, that this is the issue that he misbehaved and his associates have done as well. I could argue to say that there are some in between as well, even though polling does suggest that polling does suggest that he is still the front runner. All right, here are a closer look at the indictments returned from the special grand jury. Today's date is written on the documents, and again, it says that there are 10 indictments. And now that we know a decision was reached, we want to take a look about what's going to happen next. Now, first, the district attorney's office plans to hold a news conference with the details of the grand jury recommendations to indict, and we are told that that could happen again in the next one to yeah. three hours. We do not know at this point. Now that is likely when we get the list of who is on the list and what those charges are. After the announcement, the next step is the arraignment process. Arraignments will happen inside the Fulton County Courthouse for anyone charged with a crime. The Georgia election probe defendants will then appear before a judge shortly after the indictments are issued. They will hear the charges against them read aloud. Each one will enter a plea of guilty, not guilty, or no low, which of course means no contest. Now this could happen within a few days or up to a week, depending on how many defendants and where those people may live in the United States. So each defendant, they are also gonna go through a booking process here. Each of those defendants will likely be booked either at the courthouse or more traditionally at the Fulton County Jail. That booking will likely involve fingerprints, maybe even a mugshot. Uh, and because these are not violent charges, chances are most of them will be released from custody on some type of bond. So it's been more than two years since the 2020 election and the investigation into election meddling has taken almost just as long. And it's been a very long, kind of confusing road for a lot of folks who are not legal experts. Uh, so we're gonna break down exactly how we got here. Yeah, and it all started in the days after the 2020 election. Then President Trump had just come up short and refused to concede. His allies wasted no time going on the offense to overturn the results, first calling for Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger to resign. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham making one of the first phone calls into Raffensperger's office to discuss Georgia's results. Uh, the future of the country hangs in the balance. On December 3rd, Rudy Giuliani, Trump's then attorney, met Georgia state senators and began claiming Fulton County's election workers committed ballot fraud while counting votes at State Farm Arena. Then came a Trump request for a special state legislative session to investigate voter fraud. It was quickly shut down by Governor Brian Kemp. By mid-December, 16 fake Republican electors signed illegitimate certificates claiming Trump's victory during a meeting at the state capitol. All of these events setting in motion a phone call between Trump and Raffensperger on January 2nd, 2021. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes. After the phone call was leaked, Trump found himself in the crosshairs of newly elected Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis. Obviously, it's been a reported around the wor world that phone call and so we have said yes that is part of the investigation but it, we're not narrowing it to that a year after the trump raffensperger call d.a willis seated a special grand jury to investigate the election probe over the next eight months several of those subpoenaed refused to comply before eventually being ordered to testify trump himself was never called 
In January 2023, after 75 witnesses testified, the jurors wrapped up their investigation. We heard a lot of very compelling things, like a lot of very compelling evidence, um, a lot of very interesting things and things that we didn't expect. The jurors have told media outlets they heard at least three recorded phone calls between Trump and Georgia officials. The jury's report, which was partially released to the public, recommended perjury charges against at least one witness. But due to redactions, names were not disclosed. Former President Trump has continued to deny any wrongdoing and has repeatedly attacked D.A. Willis. They've got a local racist Democrat district attorney in Atlanta who is doing everything in her power to indict me over an absolutely perfect phone call. I think that patch actually ended on the perfect word, phone call, because that's what we want to talk about next. This phone call that was made to Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger in 2021 was something that prompted this investigation, if not the thing that prompted the investigation. So we want to bring Zach in to talk about it, because you, you've listened. You're probably one of the very, I don't know, few people on earth who's listened word for word to that over hour long phone call multiple times? I have listened through it. I, I wouldn't say I'm one of the only people on earth. I think I think there's some That's other That's not a journalist or lawyer? Well, you know, who knows? Our, our, our viewers online can, can chime in on that. And before we get to this, though, I do want to qu take a quick moment. We've got new news just in. Uh, you forgive me if I'm looking down on my phone here. We're texting back and forth with sources and trying to get the latest information from you. A little bit of new information on how uh, a trial judge is going to be assigned to this case. Uh, a source of of mine who is deeply involved in the legal community shining a little bit more light on that saying that a trial judge is assigned at random by the clerk of the court so judge Robert McBurney has been a key player in this case that said there's no guarantee that he will end up overseeing the actual trial whatever that may look like as we move down the tracks of so the criminal justice process the, the here. pool of judges is from where now that's gonna be Fulton County it'll be Fulton, Fulton County. County yes and and these are generally judges that have been appointed, of course. Uh, yes, yeah, the, the typical bench of Fulton County judges are gonna be in the pool, they're gonna be assigned randomly. Whoever gets assigned this case, it will be a random assignment. Um, and so we just wanna flag that as, especially in a night like this where even relatively small bits of information right. can have a big difference, especially when there's so many questions that are swirling as this yeah. evening goes on. I, I, again, I'm gonna offer, uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask you about the issue of time here. How, how long would a trial go on? Impossible to say. Um, I, I think, it, you know, I went to law school. I am no great legal expert. I think if you talk to folks who have been practicing for many, many years, they would, if they're being honest, say something similar. It's very difficult to say how long a trial like this would take. When could it begin? Uh, again, that's hard to say. I think, and again, we don't know. We know that 10 indictments have been handed down. We don't know who is named. We don't know what the charges are. If this is an if now because we don't know if there is a RICO charge, if this is a RICO case, as has been suggested, um, or has been rumored. We'll find out more later tonight, I believe. Yeah. But right now, if it is a RICO case, it could be a long process to get ready for trial and get to trial. The YSL case currently underway is a RICO case currently under the purview of the Fulton County District Attorney's Office, and it has taken months and months um, even to get to a point where uh, jurors can be selected um, and you've got to imagine in a case like this again we don't know who has been named as a defendant but if there are high profile defendants if if the former president Donald Trump is a defendant seating a jury that can be impartial in hearing charges against somebody who generates such strong feelings that alone could be a real process for a judge and for attorneys to just seat the jury to kick the process off from and there. And during an election year, a presidential election year, when it, at least as we see it today, uh, there is nobody standing in his way right now in, in terms of polling, if you believe that. Well, you know, it's, it's a long campaign. You're right, the former president is way out in front in the GOP primary right now. We don't know what will happen down the line, but you're right, he is uh, far and away favorite at this point according to pretty much every poll at least that I have seen. Yeah. But while we're talking about the former president here, I think this is a good moment to 
zoom out a little bit. Uh, obviously tonight, the focus, as it should be, um, is on what may be happening in Fulton County, but the former president, as we know, is already currently facing at this time three indictments, three criminal cases. One is from Florida, one is from federal court in Washington, D.C., and the third is out of New York City in state court. And so as we wait for Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis to make whatever announcement that they may make, that she may make tonight, I think it's useful at this point to zoom out and take a look at what some of the key pillars of that federal indictment, the federal election indictment, leaned on as evidence. Faith, you mentioned this earlier in the night. Yeah. Seven states were featured in that federal indictment and sealed at the beginning of August, charging yeah. the former president with four crimes. Mm -hmm. No state was featured more prominently than the state of Georgia. About five full, of the yeah, five full pages of the 45 so page how indictment. How does it queue up in terms of states? Who would have first dibs as far as having him in a courtroom? You're saying if uh, there are already three cases out there right now, right. it's a yeah. jurisdictional challenge. I think when we talk about the road to trial, that's going to be another challenge. And not just because the same defendant is named in these three cases. We don't know if he's going to be named in a, a fourth case here in Fulton County in the coming hours. But attorneys and legal resources also are going to be stretched thin. And so to be able to schedule this out, um, it's going to be quite challenging. It's going to be interesting, and I have a couple of dates here. We don't know an exact date in that DOJ case, but it was suggested by uh, Smith's office to have that trial on January 2nd. That is not set in stone. That's just what they suggested. March 25th is supposed to be the date for that New York trial. That's three weeks after Super Tuesday. May 20th is supposed to be the Mar-a-Lago trial. And if you're looking at just different uh, other civil cases and different um, election um, events. You have a potential civil fraud suit coming up in October. You have the Iowa caucuses on January 15th, Super Tuesday on March 5th, the Republican National Convention on July 15th, and of course, Election Day is next November, which is it's coming up pretty quick. And once again, this is if. Right. The, the former president is charged here. But I do want to get back, because this is a really, really important part of um, these potential charges, is this this phone call right. that sparked this investigation. Yeah, and, and I want to be a little hesitant to say it sparked it, because we only know what we know publicly. Okay. But I think it's a very safe, very accurate thing to say. At the very least, this is the most high-profile piece of potential evidence that is available publicly. Um, the federal indictment, Jack Smith's election probe indictment, featured this call between Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and then President Donald Trump prominently. We've got some excerpts from that phone call teed up for you. If we can, let's start with the perhaps most famous or infamous portion of the recording where former President Trump is heard discussing finding votes in Georgia. Let's take a listen if we have this. Look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find... It's okay, uh, I'm just going, no prompter. 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have. Now, that was a key component of the federal indictment that Jack Smith unsealed earlier this month. It's certainly the most well-known. I think it's, it's fair to say that was the one that captured far and away the yeah. most headlines. But the federal indictment spent a good chunk of time talking about other components of this phone call that I think it's probably fair to say most people haven't heard. We have these excerpted for you here. Jack Smith, the special counsel, cited, for instance, uh, an exchange between then-President Donald Trump and Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, where the former president claimed that thousands of people who were dead right. voted in the 2020 presidential election. It yep. was part of his part of his allegations that uh, unlawful activity occurred here and that the election results should be overturned. But if we can, um, can we can we listen in on this chunk of the call here? The other thing, uh, dead people, so dead people voted, and I think uh, the, the number is in the pro uh, close to 5,000 people, and they went to uh, obituaries, they went to uh, all sorts of methods to come up with an accurate number, and a minimum is close to about 5,000 voters. 
Now, now you just heard, you're right, you just heard the words of former president who was then the president, Donald Trump. Later on in that conversation, moments later, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, who was the Secretary of State then and importantly is still the Secretary of State, responded to former President Trump's comments. Take a listen. Well, Mr. President, the challenge that you have is the data you have is wrong. Uh, we, we talked to the congressmen and they were surprised, but they, uh, I guess there was a person they that came to these meetings and presented data. And he said that there was dead people, of, I believe it was upward of 5,000. The actual number were two, two, two people that were dead that voted. You're listening in, if you're just joining us right now, to excerpts of that famous and infamous phone call between then-President Donald Trump and Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. It's a key pillar of Jack Smith's most recent election indictment, unsealed, charging the former president earlier this month with uh, charges related to the 2020 election. Yeah. We don't know if and how much, if so, that call may feature into any local indictments filed here in Fulton County. But understanding that call, I, I think at the very least, helps ground us in the universe of possible evidence. 2024 looks like a world of which we have never seen in the United States. I think, I think Americans are, I don't want to say getting used to, but I think we've seen a lot of years lately for a whole host of reasons, mm. uh, lots of different reasons that make folks think that every year we are at a point where we think it can't get any more different, any more strange. Or difficult. Uh, or difficult, <laughs> uh, the bar is raised. But I think Atlanta, I think Georgia, I think the country is up to it. All right. All right, Zach Merchant, thank you. We want to go to Caitlin Ross, who has been in downtown Atlanta for us all evening. All evening long. So Caitlin is joining us outside of the Fulton County Courthouse. Caitlin, we appreciate you being out there. We know that it is very busy where you are as we continue to play this waiting game. For those of you who are just joining us, we know that 10 indictments were handed up, but we still don't know at this point who is indicted and what those charges are. Caitlin, we want to toss it out to you to paint a picture for us of what, what you're seeing out there right now. Well, that's such a good point, Faith, because everyone really is like staring at their phones, trying to figure out what's going on, waiting to see who has the latest piece of information, if anyone knows what's going to be contained in those indictments or who is going to be indicted. It's been hours now that we've all just been like eyes trained on the courthouse, waiting to see if anyone was going to walk out, give us any new information. What we do know is that District Attorney Fonnie Willis is not going to hold a news conference until after those indictments are read into the record. That means they have to be electronically entered. The clerk then has to scan out a copy. We would be able to see hard copies of those, but that could take some time. They had told us one to three hours, and in that time, of course, everyone is speculating about what that could possibly mean. And I think that in that time in between, everyone's just kind of like bracing. Like, what are we going to expect when we get the text of those indictments? I was just texting with a state representative who says they were given a directive to work remotely for the rest of today and tomorrow, just not knowing how people are going to react to what what's contained in those documents. So I think right now you have people wondering what that says, who's indicted, what are the cr alleged crimes going to be? So there's going to be a lot of late nights happening here as people really parse that out. It hasn't really gotten any thinner out here. A lot of people still waiting around. There's still a very large law enforcement presence. They're still running their sirens, their lights. You have armed security guards at the entrances and exits to the courthouse, even though the courthouse has been shut down for hours. We had Rebecca Lindstrom inside the courthouse. She told us that they were asked to leave before those indictments were read out. And so no one's even been inside the courthouse for hours that we know of, but still all of those entries and exits are guarded with police officers. Very strong presence out here still. What we know about a possible news conference is if it happens, it's likely to be just right out front. That's why you have journalists who are still set up out here waiting to see when that information is going to come down. So Faith and Jeff, a lot of of waiting right now as people look for that official word and I think also a lot of caution because no one wants to take a guess at what might be in those indictments. I think Zach did a great job explaining the process of how it all works without actually thinking what could be in there because at this point we just don't know.
Absolutely. And Caitlin, I'm glad that you mentioned just a couple of things here, uh, just for everyone at home, just to realize what's going to happen next. We did see that the indictments were coming up. And after those indictments are read into record, that is when we expect DA Fonnie Willis um, to read those charges. That's who we expect or somebody from the DA's office. And I do want to note, so it was around 921 p.m. that our Nicholas Wooten, who was inside the courtroom, tweeted out that uh, the DA's office will hold a presser. That could be one to three hours. So we're approaching what hour number one now of three from Caitlin Ross we go to Joe Ripley who is in downtown Atlanta to give us an overview of of what he is seeing and things have not been changing very much from your vantage point tonight that that security ring has pretty much held itself together all night yeah. so far we have not seen any any protests we have not seen any at least implied threats of a physical nature at least uh, viscerally at this point Yeah, that's right, Jeff, and really that could be arguably a testament to just how strong law enforcement presence has been out here all day long. We've been out here since about 10, 10 30 this morning, and we have seen much of a similar situation where law enforcement at times tested uh, by a group of protesters earlier here on an unrelated matter. But since then, things have really quieted down. Much of the media scrum has really been uh, trying to pursue witnesses who were inside for grand jury proceedings. But other than that, really uh, nothing out of the ordinary outside the Fulton County Courthouse or inside for that matter. You heard Caitlin uh, attest to the fact that security has been ramped up. This was expected. DA Fonnie Willis had you know, really told the sheriff's office, told her staff and the courthouse staff that this was coming. This was coming around this time, so prepare. Shut down if you need to. Go remote if you need to. And so that's why we haven't seen a lot of hubbub, a lot of buzz in and outside the courthouse. I do want to bring this to your attention, though, and this uh, could be a sign of, of things to come. The Trump campaign releasing this statement really blasting D.A. Willis in this entire election investigation into Georgia's 2020 election. They're asking why this was brought two and a half years after the fact, after this election, um, saying that this could possibly be politically motivated. Obviously, the former president is engaged in legal battles up and down the eastern seaboard. He's also engaged in a fierce competition to become the Republican nominee to challenge current president Joe Biden in the 2024 presidential election. We know how much Georgia played a role in 2020. Imagine what it will be like next year amid all of these legal battles. So uh, the Trump campaign talking about that, also talking about what they're calling a legal double standard. Uh, keeping in mind that some of these federal uh, prosecutions were brought by uh, Jack Smith, uh, a special counsel, brought in a third party. Uh, and so uh, in this case, this phone call that prompted Fulton DA Fonnie Willis to go after this investigation, uh, really w with seemingly uh, former President Trump at the center of it. We will see if he is listed in the indictment. That's the million dollar question. That's what everybody wants to know tonight. Unfortunately, we won't find that answer out for at least uh, another couple of hours by my clock. So I'll we'll send things back to you. But quiet scene out here in downtown Atlanta, up the street. Uh, Beyonce held her concert. The Braves won tonight. So at least a few people are happy. We're meantime waiting for uh, these answers tonight as far as this election investigation is concerned. Yeah, we're seeing a few more cars behind you as well, which is evidence of uh, uh, certainly of the concert that has been going on tonight and, and certainly has been going on uh, over the past over weekend. Over the right? weekend, a major concert here. Yep. Yeah. Wow. All right. Let's go to John Sherrick right now in downtown Atlanta, not that far away from Joe Ripley, where he is standing. John? You know, two and a half years after Fonnie Willis began this investigation of Donald Trump, it expanded from there. Suddenly, today, everything moved at lightning speed. One witness after another appearing before the grand jury here at the Fulton County Courthouse. One of the witnesses who was excused from testifying and did not have to testify before the grand jury was Atlanta journalist George Cheedy. 
Here is some video of Cheedy about an hour and a half ago as he was leaving the Fulton County Courthouse. Cheedy was ready to tell the grand jury about the day when he walked in on a meeting of Republican Party activists at the state capitol in December 2020. That meeting, he said he later found out, was a meeting of people who wanted to be the alternate electors, GOP activists who were the so-called fake electors, Trump supporters preparing to represent Georgia in the electoral college votes in Congress instead of the Democrats. Up until five minutes ago, that the district attorney believed that that observation was relevant to these legal proceedings. And perhaps it still is, but the jury may have enough information without me to make a decision. Witnesses late this afternoon and then early this evening also included the now former Georgia Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan. Duncan is a Republican who has been critical of the way that Trump supporters have taken over Georgia's Republican Party and continue to argue that the election in 2020 was stolen. They continue to try to overturn the results in Georgia, which they insist Trump won without any evidence to, to, uh, to prove that that, in fact, is the case. This grand jury uh, uh, coming out of all that happened beginning November 4th, 2020, extending into December at the state capitol and across this state. Then, of course, that infamous phone call on January 2nd, 2021. Fonnie Willis in February of 21, 2021 began this investigation, which is now apparently culminating in these grand jury indictments. Sean, you have been covering news longer than anybody I know in Atlanta. Have you ever seen a night quite like this one? This is a historic courthouse, and my experience with this historic courthouse really began in February of 20, well, on February of 1982, when Wayne Williams was tried and convicted in this courthouse on that fourth floor where the grand jury was just meeting tonight. That trial lasted most of February, and the verdict came down on a Saturday night in February where it was much like what we're seeing here tonight. Uh, it seemed like the whole world was packed into the lobby of the Fulton County Courthouse. Reporter Paul Crawley was on a two-way radio up on the fourth floor long before cell phones telling me what what the verdicts were and I was down in the lobby with another two-way radio we were live on the air conveying those verdicts and of course then there was the courthouse shooting the infamous tragic horrible courthouse shooting with Brian Nichols escape escaping this courthouse after shooting Judge Roland Barnes upstairs in this courthouse and others as well so there have been some tragic scenes some historic scenes at this courthouse those are two examples one more example tonight yeah and another example the name over just over your head and up a little bit lewis slayton the former district attorney of fulton county whose name is now on that building involved of course with wayne williams and the tragedy of atlanta back in that era john Sherrick, thank you all right now we want to turn to our eyes and ears inside the courtroom earlier today one of them we did have a couple of reporters we're going to go to 11 lives investigative reporter rebecca lindstrom who was inside the courthouse so um, rebecca can you put on your investigative hat for us tonight and talk to us a little bit about what you saw just for those who might just be joining us or just giving a little bit more insight i will start it off with we saw this gigantic stack of papers being handed to judge robert mcburney after you all were waiting for quite some time We did. I spent most of my day on the eighth floor of this building in Judge McBurney's courtroom. And throughout the day, he was coming in when he could, just giving little updates. He obviously didn't know the timing of when things were going to come down either, but he would receive word from the DA's office that they needed more time. They needed more time. And when it did happen, I went back, I checked the video. It was, as I remembered, only about two minutes long, the length of time that they they walked in with those stack of papers, had them signed, reviewed by Judge McBurney, handed back to the court clerk and left the courtroom to start the process of filing those papers so that we could all begin to read them and see exactly what is inside. Now we talk about that stack and one thing we don't know about that stack is just how many pieces of that 
of those papers actually are involved in this case. So keep in mind the grand jurors were hearing other cases today and we do know that they uh, brought up 10 indictments but we don't know involving how many different cases those are. So we can look at that, we can say big stack, we can draw some uh, parallels and, and assume that perhaps a lot of that is related to the case that has brought all of the media out here for the past few days. But we won't know officially until all of those indictments have been filed electronically and the district attorney has had the opportunity to share some of her insight into why she pursued those charges and the charges that the grand jurors eventually did agree to pursue. Now, I will tell you what was interesting is that just sort of the feeling inside the courtroom, we, I think all of us in the media had a sense that we were going to be able to learn more about those indictments when they were brought into the courtroom, and that just wasn't the case. As I said earlier, about two minutes, that was it. And it was a very formal process. Uh, they just asked to make sure that everything went as expected. The staff member with the district attorney's office said yes, and then McBurney flipped through the papers, signed the ones that he needed, handed them back to the court clerk, and again, they were off. So he was not giving up any information as to what was on those pages. He was going to leave it for the district attorney and for the court clerk to be able to do their process before that information is released. But you were hearing earlier, John was talking about just the history around this building and some of the court cases that have happened here. All of this hopefully preparing the deputies and the judges and the staff for what could be to come over the next few weeks, the few months, and some might even say few years. I will tell you today it was all very orderly, a little eerie actually walking through the halls and seeing so few people inside. We all know that this is pretty much the busiest courthouse in the state of Georgia. So for the hallways to just be empty, to be quiet, uh, really was was surreal and so it was interesting to just watch the clock tick and to wonder when is this going to happen when is this going to happen and realize that the only people really inside this building were staff members associated with the proceedings taking place with the grand jury and the media and so it's the hurry up and wait we hurried up to all get here we waited to see what the decision was going to be we know that that decision has now been made so now we are waiting to hear from the district attorney and from the court clerk's office as to exactly what is contained in those indictments Rebecca, is, is there anything that's really surprised you today and tonight? Is uh, other other than uh, kind of eerie in the halls of a very very busy courthouse that we're not that way today? What surprised you about what you have seen? Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's been too much actually that has surprised me. I have been very impressed with the order. Uh, there was a plan that had been put in place weeks ago and the staff, the sheriff's office, they have implemented that plan. Everything, you know, I, I don't have any wood to knock on, so I, I don't want to jinx anything, but everything appears to have been going smoothly. Um, there haven't been any major disruptions here. Now, again, it's hard to protest perhaps if you don't know exactly what those indictments say. I think a lot of people are waiting for the information to come in to really understand how to react. Uh, that's why, you know, comments that I've heard made earlier this evening that this really is the warm up. I think that that is very much the case, that this is the warm up, because right now what they're having to deal with are the media, and no one wants to get kicked out. No one wants to get in trouble with the judge. No one wants to get in trouble with law enforcement. So we're following the rules. But as other people might be attracted to downtown or information spread that may not uh, always be the case one thing that is interesting about these these indictments um, if they do indeed include former president donald trump uh, a lot of people are really going to be keeping a close eye on Georgia. Uh, those who maybe haven't paid as much attention to it yet will be, and that is because we have open courtrooms. Uh, you know, like I said, the media was sitting inside Judge McBurney's courtroom today waiting for those indictments to be brought in. And all of those high profile cases that you were talking about before, the media was able to be a part of that.
That is very different than federal court. Let me tell you, when we go into federal court, we have to check in our phones. You have to check in your laptops. It goes back to old school where you're writing on a piece of paper and using a pen in order to jot notes. We reach out to an artist to draw sketches so that we have some visuals to kind of relay what it looked like inside of the courtroom. But when it comes to our Fulton County Superior Court, in general, cameras are allowed in the courtroom and they're allowed in these proceedings. So out of all of the indictments that um, Donald Trump faces, this could be the one that gets the most public scrutiny. And so I think that's why you're seeing so many eyes and so much interest on what is happening here. It's not just, oh, what is Georgia doing now? This really is the opportunity for the public to be invited into the conversation um, or at least to be able to, to sort of uh, be the fly on the wall as that conversation is taking place and to see firsthand for themselves what's occurring. Jeff? And before, Jeff does have one more question for you, but I just want to update you all that we did just get notice that two of our reporters are with a group of other reporters going back into a room where we believe the press conference will take place. We don't think it's gonna take place in the next five minutes or anything like that, but we do know that that is movement that we are seeing. So they are gearing up for some type of announcement. We do have another question for you though, Rebecca. You know, Rebecca, as, as I listen to you speak about this grand sure. jury procedure, I'm sort of struck by the fact that when it comes to covering trials, whether it's on local television or it's in print, it's easier to cover. You have a lot of emotion from victims, from perpetrators, from attorneys, oftentimes from family members that have gathered in the courtroom, and, and oftentimes judges as well. This is totally different. This is a new territory that uh, certainly doesn't get much coverage on local television, nor do I see a lot of it in newspapers around the country. It is very procedural, it is very bloodless, and it is very dense in terms of how the choreography of these grand juries go. Certainly when you even think about some of the charges that um, could be at play here. Um, again, we don't know what's in the indictments. Hopefully we're going to be finding out here any moment. Uh, but when you think about some of those that could be at play here, they're really complicated. You start talking about RICO, racketeering, and, and just even politics in general. Right now there's so much emotion wrapped around um, the these allegations. A lot of people have, have already made up their mind and they're, they're tuning out the conversation. But whether there's emotion in play in the courtroom, I think there will still be a lot of interest in this because there is emotion outside of the courtroom. And people are going to want to listen to those arguments to know if they fit into the narrative that they agree with or the narrative that they disagree with. And that's the that's the good thing. That's what I like about this opportunity is that with that camera in the courtroom, it's not just going to be the reporters telling the people at home what was said or what to, you know, we, we never tell you what to think, but we try to pass along the information as best and fairly as we can. Well, you're going to have that access to really kind of listen and make those decisions for yourself as well as we go through this. So we're going to send it back to you to see what kind of information is coming out of the DA's office. Rebecca Lindstrom, thank you. We have the indictments right now in front of us. Zach Merchant, has just made his way over to where we are sitting right now, and we are are sort of gathering we our thoughts and, and looking at them as uh, as uh, they have first arrived. This what do you it. see right um, now? I, this is it. This is not even the full document. This is the first few pages of the indictment. Um, we are reading this together. This is just posted in the Fulton County Court online docket literally seconds ago. Here are the big top takeaways right now. Former President Donald John Trump is the first named defendant in this indictment. Rudy Giuliani is also named. John Eastman, Mark Meadows, Kenneth Cheeseborough, Jeffrey Clark, Jenna Ellis, Ray Stallings Smith, Robert Cheeley, Michael A. Roman, David James Schaefer, Sean Micah Tresher Still, Stephen Cliffgard Lee, Harrison William Prescott, Travion Cuddy, Sidney Powell, Kathleen Latham, Scott Hall, and Misty Hampton are all named as indictments. Wow. Again, we are getting this just right now to the desk. Uh, we should also note too, Again, we're reading this together. And as we're reading this, we're also taking a live look inside of the room where the press conference is expected to take place any moment now. Uh, these 
charges just dropping moments ago. He really just printed it out, ran through to come on set right now. So just taking a look at it, we can't confirm that this is now the fourth criminal indictment for former President Donald Trump, the fourth criminal indictment for former President Donald Trump here in Fulton County. Atlanta, Georgia. We can now confirm, we can also now confirm, I think without any doubt, that this is a RICO, this is a RICO case. It's yep. the first charge here in a list of, let's see, let's count them up, um, 41 charges are listed in this indictment. We should be clear that not every defendant is charged with every count here. Are you surprised at how many individuals there are? I think a little bit, um, but again, like we've been talking about all night, RICO cases can be quite widespread, quite sprawling. Yeah. Um, and, and if you're a prosecutor who wants to lean into what is, in their view, a full story, a RICO right. case helps them tell the fuller story in their view. How about some of these charges here? We're, we're taking a look at solicitation of violation of oath by a public officer, false statements, writings, a, a very familiar litany of charges and actions. Well, as we've been talking about, the RICO statute requires that prosecutors prove what are known as predicate crimes or uh, basically requisite crimes. Um, some of these, like false statements and forgery, satisfy that predicate crime requirement that's needed to prove a RICO case. So it doesn't surprise me that we're seeing things like forgery and false statements in this document right now. Um, and we are so just there you have it, guys. Ahead. Breaking news right now. Former President Donald Trump, along with several others, indicted here in Fulton County. This makes former President Donald Trump's fourth criminal indictment uh, in a, a matter of months, it seems. And yes. now we're getting, we're getting even more documents coming to the news desk right now. Let's actually, if we can here, let's go ahead. Um, this is easily. Storm trackers. It's how you see weather happening now across Metro Atlanta. These severe storms are now closing in. We could be talking about damaging winds, hail. And how you can plan ahead by knowing what's coming overhead. Heavy storms are rolling in. It's Attorney's Office. This is the introduction here. Defendant Donald John Trump lost the United States presidential election held on November 3rd, 2020. One of the states he lost was Georgia. Trump and the other defendants charged in this indictment refused to accept that Trump lost and they knowingly and willfully joined a conspiracy to unlawfully change the outcome of the election in favor of Trump. That conspiracy contained a common plan and purpose to commit two or more acts of racketeering activity in Fulton County, Georgia, elsewhere in the state of Georgia, and in other states. Again, if you're just joining us, that is the one paragraph introduction to this many, many, many pages long it indictment naming former President Donald very Trump. Very thick stack of indictments. And just to recap everything that's going on right now, folks, just in the last couple of minutes, we have learned that 19 people are named in this indictment, 41 charges coming down, including former President uh, Donald Trump here. Zach Merchant is helping us get through all of these indictments. We are, or all of the pages of it, it's a very thick stack. And what you're taking a look at on your screen here is a room where a press conference by the DA's office is expected to happen, where she will likely lay out the charges and who's indicted here. Uh, and our reporters are standing by to get that. From so, so how large is this comparatively to, to some of the issues that Mr. Trump is, is facing? Is, is this uh, substantially larger? Is it similar in scope? Is it more complicated? It obviously has more individuals that are named than the other ones. I think at first blush, and again, it very much is first blush. I'm, I'm we putting are, you on no, the spot. No, it's okay. We are all getting that. this uh, in real time. And I think and we I have think, some more copies coming to the desk yeah, right now, too. I think people who are at home um, are probably getting ready to read through this as well. Um, this is John Eastman here. You see him on your screen right now. He is named as one of the defendants in this criminal indictment handed up by the Fulton County Grand Jury. Uh, John Eastman sent memos to the Trump campaign outlining a 
plan where Mike Pence, the vice president at the time, could refuse to count some of Biden's 2020 electoral college votes. Also, uh, during a Georgia state Senate hearing on December, uh, in December of 2020, Eastman told lawmakers that they had the duty to replace the state's slate of Democratic electors, citing widespread voter fraud that was later debunked by uh, Georgia Secretary of State's Elections Board investigation and others. And finally, we should note John Eastman is a former law clerk of yeah. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Another person that is listed in this indictment is attorney Jenna, Jenna Ellis. She was among the Trump allies who testified in Georgia, the Georgia Senate, about voter fraud. In December of 2020, Fulton County prosecutors say Ellis continued to push claims of voter fraud even after state officials debunked them. Ellis, you know, when, when I think about Jenna Ellis, I, I really think about Vice President Mike Pence. Yeah. And she was the one who wanted him to ignore the Electoral College. And that, that certainly uh, had played in the events of that first week of January that that uh, all of this was uh, certainly a part of it. But Jenna Ellis certainly is, is part of this. The next person that we want to talk about here that's listed in it is uh, Trump's former New York, excuse me, Trump's attorney, former attorney, former mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani. In 2018, he became Trump's personal attorney and then a key lawyer for the campaign after the 2020 election. Giuliani fueled the flames of rumors that was were that there was election fraud in Georgia. He was also behind this presentation to the Georgia Senate claiming that there was ballot stuffing in State Farm Arena. He test that's right here. He testified before the Georgia Senate panel in December of 2020 that has become a central part of both local and federal investigations. And we had an interview with him tonight where he yeah. was on the streets of New York where he was asked about the impending indictments in which he faced. He said these are all uh, political and dynamic, that you have uh, a man in Donald Trump who is the GOP leader at this point and in all probability will be the nominee, at least according to Mr. Giuliani, and said that this is all political and dynamic and in nature. Mark Meadows, the former Trump chief of staff, also uh, mentioned on this. Uh, he was also on the line for the infamous Raffensperger phone call and uh, stuck alongside the president in the aftermath of the 2020 election. Prosecutors say that there were emails and meetings and a surprise visit to Georgia uh, made for the benefit of his boss. Before joining and President Trump in the White House, Mr. Meadows was a congressman from North Carolina. And before we move forward, we have um, obviously a lot more to get through here. I just want to flag one point as I am reading through this indictment. Uh, early on in the paperwork here, the Fulton County District Attorney's Office lays out all 19 of the named defendants. We've okay. been talking about them. We're working through them on air right now. But notably here, the indictment also says there are unindicted co-conspirators okay. named individual one through individual 30. And, and what does that mean? That, that means true? that there are 30 people who the Fulton County District Attorney's Office believes were connected to a criminal conspiracy, the racketeering, the RICO organization. But not enough to indict. But, well, that's not quite, no. Um, in a lot of cases, unindicted co-conspirators are left unnamed in paperwork like this, sometimes as an effort to put pressure on them to flip, to testify. Um, but it, it effectively means that the district attorney's office thinks there are more people connected to this and more people who have legal exposure to this alleged criminal conspiracy. Do you believe that we will see them named in the weeks ahead? Impossible to say. The federal indictment um, released earlier, un unsealed earlier this month, had six unindicted co-conspirators there as well. We'll have to keep a close eye on both situations to see how that plays out. It wouldn't surprise me if some of them are later named. We used to hear some of that during the Watergate days of, yeah. of unindicted co-conspirators into the, the break-in of, of uh, the Watergate Hotel. And, and, and certainly that's the political dynamic of which we have heard that phrase before. It can be, a, uh, I would imagine, a very uncomfortable position to be in, too, if you're reading through this and you think you may be one of the unindicted co-conspirators, uh, that certainly can put some pressure on you to discuss with your attorney and make some hard decisions for yourself on how you're going to move forward. That said, um, let's keep moving through what we have here. I think yeah, we have... We're going to talk about yeah. Kathy Latham next. She is indicted. She was involved with, uh, with the fake elector scheme.
Kathy Latham was the Republican chairwoman of Coffee County in 2020, which has become a big, lot, very talked about in recent weeks here with this case. That's a small county in southeast Georgia. Prosecutors say she was part of the alternate elector scheme. You might have heard them called fake electors following the election where Republicans submitted illegitimate electoral college votes in favor of President Donald Trump. This was, if you remember, uh, witness George Cheedy talking about this is um, he saw in the courthouse this meeting of fake electors. She was also seen on surveillance footage on January 7th, 2021, escorting pro-Trump operatives to the Coffee County Elector's Office. That's some surveillance video you're seeing right there, people coming in and out of the office. That's the same day a voting system at that location was breached. David Schaefer, the former head of the Georgia Republican Party, former state senator. Prosecutors say he was part of the alternate electors scheme following the election in which Republicans submitted illegitimate electoral college votes in favor of the former president. He oversaw the December 2020 meeting where 16 Georgia Republicans cast electoral college ballots claiming that Mr. Trump had believe. won the election. David Schaefer ran unsuccessfully for the post of Lieutenant Governor in the state of Georgia. I think while we have a moment here, let's dig a little bit more into the document itself, yeah. into the indictment. Uh, I think we all remember that period after Election Day 2020, or the roughly eight, nine weeks afterward, where there was a uh, concerted effort to raise concerns, raise allegations that the final vote count was unlawful. There were state legislative hearings right here in Georgia where supposed evidence of uh, fraudulent voting was presented and on page 16 of this indictment under the manner and methods of the enterprise section uh, prosecutors write and I'm, I'm quoting here I'm reading this just as we read it together they say members of the enterprise this is the racketeering the RICO enterprise that they allege occurred members of the enterprise including several of the defendants appeared at hearings in Fulton County Georgia before members of the Georgia General Assembly on December 3rd December 10th and December 30th of 2020 at those hearings members of the enterprise made false statements concerning fraud in the November 2020 presidential election the purpose the allegations right here the prosecutors I should say right here the purpose of these false statements was to persuade Georgia legislators to reject lawful electoral votes cast by the duly elected and qualified presidential electors from Georgia. So the translation of all of this is essentially that they came before the group of legislators and essentially lied. Is that correct? Is, false is that statements. what the charge is? Yes, it is. Um, right off the top, you see false statements to and solicitation of state legislators. You're exactly right. Okay. So we want to give Zach a little bit more time to get through this indictment because as you guys can see here, I mean, it's a very thick... Let me see. How many pages is this? It looks like it's even nearly 100 Pushing pages 100. worth of yeah, documents here so we really want you to be able to go through it so we can bring it to you so first we want to get back to our caitlin ross you've seen her live all night outside of the courthouse we're going to go back to her right now and caitlin if you can hear me we want you to paint a picture for us but also if you have any information at all about what's taking place inside we're hearing that not all outlets are actually being allowed into the area where they're giving the press conference i do believe that we have a camera end there. Caitlin, what are you hearing on your end? Exactly right, Faith. We actually just walked up there. The district attorney changed the venue. We first thought it was going to be right here on the courthouse steps. About half an hour ago, we got notification it was going to be inside the government building. If you're familiar with Prior Street, that's just across the street, up the stairs, over in a conference room in the government building, and a heavy police presence in there. They're really being very careful about who they allow into this news conference. They have a clipboard with names on a list. If your name's not on the list, you are not getting in. So people who didn't get their names on that list are very frustrated outside that conference room right now, not allowed inside to partake. But we do have a camera inside that news conference getting set up right now. Savannah Levins is inside waiting for the district attorney to start speaking. She's able to set up a live shot in there. So as soon as we have any new information, we're going to be able to bring you that live on our newscast. And what we're looking for is an explanation of how they got to this point. Like you said, Faith, this charging document more than 100 pages long. So there is a lot of 
of information to work through. 19 people named in this indictment. Those are a lot of people to go through. We know that District Attorney Fonnie Willis has been investigating this case since January 3rd of 2021. She's been looking into a number of different allegations. And so we're really going to see those laid out. We're going to hear her explain how she got to this point, who she called, who needed who she needed to talk to to get her to this point. So this news conference is really going to explain a lot of the missing pieces that we've been waiting for. We saw the cover sheet of that charging document hours ago, and since then it's really just been a flurry of speculation as to what could be in this, what's it going to look like. We're getting a lot more of those details now, Zach Merchant walking through those legal charges, and as soon as District Attorney Fani Willis speaks, we're going to have that live on 11 Alive, and we're going to get a lot more information. Faith and Jeff? Glenn, I'm sorry to bring out the word speculation, but I'm going to do it again with you here. Who's to say that perhaps Fannie Willis does not have a news conference here in the next 35, 45, or 60 minutes and really doesn't have a lot to say? I mean, might she be somewhat silent about the tact from here on that she will not be completely revealing as to where she has been, that she doesn't feel that sort of need to share with the public as of yet? That's a great point, Jeff. There is every possibility that she could come out and say, here's the paperwork, take a read, see you later. We have been told that there would be some sort of news conference, but exactly what she's going to say in there, we have no idea. So that's a really good point. I think a lot of journalists out here are all combing through that documentation. Like 11 Alive, a lot of people have legal analysts who are helping us break all of this down because this is complicated stuff. RICO statutes are difficult to interpret. And I think even the district attorney brought in someone who specializes in in RICO statutes, knowing that to get these grand jury indictments back, the prosecutors really have to lay out a very specific case. So a lot went into this. It's been two years in the making, but whether or not she's going to lay out her thought process, who she interviewed, what she's thinking if this case goes to trial. Jeff, that's a great question. It's anyone's guess at this point. We are set up inside. We have a live location locked down, and we're going to have all of that information as soon as it becomes available. I know a lot of people have been waiting hours for this. Folks have been standing outside this courthouse for hours. They've been standing outside this courthouse for a week, locking in their positions, waiting to see what's going to come out of this. So really down to the 11th hour here, we're getting this information in late in our newscast, but hoping that that news conference does start soon so we can get people some answers as to what exactly is in that document and what we can look at going forward. Because I think you were making the point earlier that this isn't going to be a short-lived thing. This is what we are going to be talking about in Georgia for not just the coming days or months, but the coming years. Jeff and Faith? Yeah, I'm curious to see what this news conference looks like. It, yeah. it may be like playing poker. You may not show your hand as of yet. We'll see. It's going to be very interesting to see. Caitlin, yep. thank you so much for your insight and perspective and sticking with us all night. We want to go down the street to Joe Ripley. He is also outside of the courthouse. Joe has been live for us all day. So, Joe, you're hearing it with us. We are hearing that there are 19 people named in this indictment. It is a RICO case, 41 charges. This indictment paperwork, nearly 100 pages. Joe, can you paint a picture? Has there been any movement out there? I see a couple of cars. Have there been any, is everything still really locked down? Has there been increased security? What are you seeing? Yeah, so in fact, just moments ago, we saw an armored vehicle from the Fulton County Sheriff's Office uh, race by us here on MLK Drive. We're posted up at the corner at MLK Drive and Pryor Street, which you see a portion of is blocked off right now by deputies as they continue to secure this area. You mentioned a little bit about this indictment, Faith. Well, the first name on this indictment, former President Donald Trump, he's facing 13 charges at the very least, according to this indictment, which we are pouring through page by page, word by word. We understand uh, the RICO Act violation is the very first charge the former president is facing, along with at least three counts of solicitation, a violation of oath by public officer. Uh, a number of conspiracy charges uh, here uh, against the former president. And this uh, uh, we see throughout these charges as they are listed in this indictment. Go back to a, what D.A. Willis is calling a furtherance of the conspiracy. You might have heard the phrase big lie that uh, Georgia's 2020 election was somehow tainted, somehow inaccurate, uh, in uh, uh, going against what former President Trump hoped would happen for him, which is that he would win Georgia. This indictment then goes on to explain 
how former President Trump posted on Twitter, used national news outlets to uh, further his thought, his strategy, his philosophy of why Georgia's election was, in his words, unfair. It also, this indictment goes on to uh, list a number of people that former President uh, Trump is believed to have reached out to, including RNC Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel, uh, including Georgia Attorney General Chris Carr, the late Georgia House Speaker David Ralston, among others. And this is just in the last few minutes that we've gotten our hands on this indictment, which has now been made public, as I'm sure you're aware of if you're watching this right now. So, uh, again, the the, uh, the grand jury has spent uh, days really going over uh, some of this witness testimony, uh, speeding up their timeline. We thought this, this information might come out within the next day or two. Turns out it comes on a Monday night. What a way to start a week. So far, we have not heard of any rumblings of protests yet. Uh, but that could change in the coming days as some of these defendants, uh, all of these defendants will be asked to come here, get processed, as any defendant would. Will plea deals uh, play a role in this? You've heard uh, all night really about the, the RICO charges and just how broad and widespread and expansive, uh, hard to interpret those can be. We've seen it as an MO from DA Fonnie Willis, whether it's the uh, APS cheating scandal, whether it's the YSL um, trial that's currently ongoing. And if it's any indication, this could take a while to unpack, maybe weeks, maybe months, possibly even years, and we're facing presidential election here in the next uh, 14 months or so. Much for laying that all out for us. Um, and before we took our picture, you actually saw inside of the presser. I don't know if we can throw that picture back up because it looked like we could actually see some reporters sitting down there. But we just got these indictments. Once again, for folks who are just joining us, um, this was breaking news within the last 20 minutes, you guys would say. Uh, we learned that there are 19 people named in this indictment, 41 charges. And I just want to go through some of the charges for you before we turn to our Zach Merchant, who has been very, very busy digging through this indictment to break it down for you all. Count one, the biggest one that has been heavily speculated for the last couple of weeks, months, violation of the Georgia RICO, Racketeer Influenced and Corruption Organizations Act. So that was one of the biggest charges. We also have multiple conspiracy charges, solicitation of violation of oath by public officer, false statements and writings. I mean, the list goes on, Zach. So you've been reading through it and you've circled some things, some significant points here. Yeah, I haven't gone far. Um, we're still, I am still working on getting through the full indictment here. Here are the points that are sticking out to me right now. The first, Faith, you're talking about the charges. The biggest defendant by far is former President Donald Trump. He is charged with 13 counts of this, let's count them up here, of this 41 page, or should say 41 count indictment. Of those counts, many of them are solicitation of violation of oath by a public officer, uh, conspiracy to commit uh, different kinds of crimes. But I also want to note here as well that we talked throughout the evening about how RICO charges give a prosecutor more leeway than is typical and we have noted as well that in order to prove a RICO charge uh, prosecutors have to show that any named defendant committed uh, an act in furtherance of that RICO conspiracy. This is how far the indictment is reaching right now. Um, just into about the first 24 pages, District Attorney Fonnie Willis and her team of prosecutors are citing conversations and interactions between the former president and his allies with elected leaders and officials in Pennsylvania, in Arizona, and in Michigan. So when we talk about the broad breadth of this possible case and evidence that could be drawn in, um, it reaches beyond the boundaries of Is our state. Is that difficult to prove? I think... I think our legal analyst would be the best place to answer that question, um, but I also think in an indictment that is this long, um, there's a lot of redundancy in here. You see defendants named in repeated places in this long list of predicate acts. So here's my, here's my question to you sure. as I sit here and I think about the political ramifications of this. Is there an ambiguity in this that Trump's supporters who plan on voting for him, which is a significant amount of people at this point, will see this? in the political framework? I think there's no question that there is a segment of the American public, um, in the American elected 
officials as well that no matter what happens they're going to see this as as the former president has argued this is another indication that he is the recipient of a political witch hunt. That said, I think folks who get up and will say that uh, this country is hope hopelessly divided um, and people can't change their minds clearly don't know a lot about the state of Georgia. We were the pivotal state in the 2020 elections in the Senate runoff as well because people here in this state have shown and again and again a willingness to look through, evaluate the evidence, evaluate candidates and make up their own minds. So with all that said, yeah, probably many people are going to see this and have preconceived notions, but many too are going to, just like we are, follow through the process, see what the evidence is, uh, and make their own minds up. And you're right, former President Trump is way out ahead in uh, every poll that I've seen in the GOP primary race right now, no question about it. But, but it's a long road, it's a long road to trial, and it's a long road to primary day, and it's an even longer road to election day. Americans are going to have a lot to, to think about. And I also don't think that the DA is concerned with polling numbers. She's concerned about bringing down charges. And I, I wanted to point something out, um, and Zach, you went to law school, I didn't, but <laughs> I see that the first count, this RICO charge, it seems like it's about 71 pages of the indictment, a very thick portion of the indictment. I mean, is that any indication of just how complicated I this, think, this count is? I think more than anything, uh, one, yes, RICO charges, RICO cases, we've seen it in the RICO cases we've covered here. They are complicated, they are sprawling, they're big, typically speaking. I think it also, more than anything else, just shows how this case is undergirded by the RICO charge. Everything else is sort of built on top of the bedrock of the RICO charge in this uh, very long, almost 100-page indictment here. Yeah. So, Zach, we want to give you a little bit more time to get through <laughs> the almost 100-page indictment. Thank you. And our Savannah Levins is inside of that room where we are still awaiting a press conference. If we can get a live picture in there, uh, we saw moments ago folks going in, and there you see the podium right there. And I don't know if we have Savannah live, if she could paint a picture for us. Savannah, can you hear us? Yeah, so I am uh, standing inside the room where this press conference is about to begin, speaking a little lowly because it's uh, pretty quiet in here. But if you've been watching this live shot, you've seen them kind of uh, setting up that background there, moving those flags a little closer. We just got a mic check, so assuming here shortly we should be uh, getting uh, an update from uh, DA Funny Willis or, or someone on her team about those indictments uh, that were handed down. So it should be any minute here shortly. It seems like everyone uh, who is kind of on that list is here and uh, set up. So it should be any minute here, and we're just uh, kind of standing by and waiting to, to see what we hear. And it could be not much, you know. Uh, it, it's unclear what we're going to hear um, from the district attorney uh, if she is kind of just going to lay out what uh, has been entered as far as those indictments, or if she's going to go more in depth into the process of uh, this grand jury and what they heard today. Uh, but we should uh, know here shortly. All right, Savannah, and if you guys are noticing, Savannah, she's using her inside voice because, like you all can see, this is inside of a press hall, uh, and we are hearing that this press conference could come down any minute now. They are doing some audio checks. I asked Zach a moment ago while we were listening to Savannah about, what do you think Fannie Willis does here? Does she, does she spell out the case? Does she... Is she relatively coy? Does she not show what she's thinking? Honestly, very difficult to say. Yeah. Um, it, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if she got up and made brief remarks and then said uh, effectively that the indictment should do most of the talking. Um, but we don't know. We, we simply don't know. We've heard, I think, uh, more from the Fulton County District Attorney, Fonnie Willis, publicly than certainly we have from federal special counsel Jack Smith in the federal election probe. Weigh that as you will. Um, I, I do want to circle back to a point Faith made earlier, just moments ago, about um, the charges, and we're talking about the RICO charge in particular. I said that it, it, in my opinion, undergirds this entire case. Here's a little bit more evidence to back that up. Uh, we saw that of the 19 named defendants here, not every one of them is facing every count laid out in this indictment. Okay. There is one count that every defendant faces. That's count one. It's the RICO count. Yeah. Yeah. 
which makes sense. That's why it's, it's 71 pages of the 98 pages that we're seeing do here. You, do you think that this potentially sets precedent for other states to become more immersed in these kinds of national issues? I think it's certainly, I think it's certainly a precedent-setting case right here in Georgia. Uh, this is uh, how so. And well, uh, not the least of which, I think right off the front, you've got to say, I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that there has never been a more prominent defendant named in a criminal case in the history of the state. Mm. Um, up until earlier this year, a president had never been named in a criminal charge ever. Um, this year we've seen the former president named in three indictments in other places around the country and now a fourth right here in Fulton County. But even if we read the news, folks follow along, in some ways it can feel like this is the fourth one and somehow the importance and the severity and the seriousness of it has been diminished in some way. Um, but it hasn't been. This has never happened in our state before. It is going to be, I think, a challenge that our city and our state has never faced before. And certainly, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis, she's an experienced prosecutor. Yeah. Um, she's never prosecuted a case against a defendant like this. We expect to see the former president here in Atlanta at some point for a mugshot, too. That's right. Uh, the former president and 18 other of the named defendants. When do you who think that happens? Any idea? In the coming days. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a challenge. Does it happen this week? It can. Um, I think. I'm sorry to put you on the No, no, it's okay. Um, I, I think we've mentioned earlier it, these sort of things depend a little bit on where a defendant is located. Um, if you're somebody who's got to travel in from out of town, that may push your date back a little bit. Um, I think former President Trump may fall into that category. There are others uh, named here who have deep ties to the state of Georgia who may, we may see sooner rather than later being booked. And that's, I guess that might be a question for a legal analyst, or we might learn together at this press conference that could happen any time now. But that's a good, I'm glad that you brought that point up, because we've seen former President Trump fly in, um, motorcade out, do the, the court appearance three times now, which I suppose is still unprecedented, right? So we're going to see that here in Georgia. But the question is, are we going to see multiple days of this with multiple people will everybody go on the same day and even when it comes to a potential trial will these folks be tried together will they be tried separately there's still a lot of unanswered questions there especially since you're talking about rico charges yeah and 19 named defendants right i, I think you're you're right on the money here when you think about down the line now how does this play out from here we don't know for sure. We don't know what a defense strategy might be. We don't know what the, the state strategy, the prosecutor's strategy will be. I think it's likely that there will be arguments on motions to sever, what's known as severing some defendants from the case and effectively, instead of having one large trial with all 19 defendants, spin out some defendants into their own trials. Um, and there may be pushback, it may be argued. Yeah. We don't know for sure, but I think that's a, a safe bet. We could see that in the coming weeks and months. And I want to break in here for the folks at home. We are not, you know, just reading these all out. This, this is available for you on 11alive.com. You can read every single page for yourself. And I think that's important here for people, you know, if they have the time um, and the interest to, to read it for yourself and really understand what these charges are, you know, so you know, I don't know who has time to read 98 pages worth of We've talked about this, but we've, it is out there for for you to read. We've it. talked about this this tonight. It it is, it is a chance for folks to make up their own minds yeah. about something that is at the core of our country's political ecosystem, and in a lot of ways, going to play a central role in the march towards the 2024 presidential election. This is an opportunity for people to read the case against the former president to read the evidence that the prosecutors have laid out up to this point in the indictment. And moving forward, as we mentioned, in Georgia, cameras, both still cameras and video cameras, are typically allowed inside the courtrooms. So folks are going to have an opportunity to see in real time, most likely, how this plays out in court as well. So we have sat here going on five hours, and we now have in front of us at least 100 pages of uh, indictments and action from the Fulton County Superior Court. W what has surprised you about any of this? Uh, is any of this in front of you 
a surprise as far as your expectation to begin the evening? I think anybody who can look at this and see the former president of the United States named as the first defendant in a criminal indictment and can see that and say that they're not surprised uh, is lying to themselves. Mm -hmm. Even if, as we have, there's been rumors and there's been insinuations, there's been a lot of signs pointing to this moment. This is, uh, it, I think, to anybody who can zoom out of the sort of constant big news moment after big news moment after big news moment that I think we all have felt over the past many years, this is um, deeply serious. It's very surprising, I think, just to see where we are right now, to see a former president named as a defendant. As far as the actual charges here go, we had a sense that it would be a fairly broad far-reaching case. We had a sense that there would likely be multiple named defendants. I don't think anybody up here, certainly I didn't expect to see 19 named defendants. I didn't expect to see as many as, I think it's north of 40. I think it's 41 counts in the indictment here. And you said 30 co-conspirators? 30 unindicted co-conspirators. Co so that means we okay. have the 19 who are named. Okay. And then the district attorney's office believes there are 30 other people who have some exposure to this case and some connection to it who have not, for one reason or another, been named in this indictment. Now, it's not to say that they couldn't be named later in a superseding indictment. That means uh, effectively more paperwork that comes out that lays out allegations against new people in connection to this case. Um, but right now, according to the indictment, 30 people unnamed co-conspirators. Litigation is incredibly expensive yep. and Donald Trump is a man of great wealth but he is also looking at defending himself against these charges around the country. It's going to be very very expensive. Meanwhile I take a look at some of these names that I've recognized from our state who are not wealthy people that are going to find themselves having to find legal representation and writing this out and the ramifications of that and the potential economic destruction of their own portfolio or their own savings is going to be very intense. It's going to be something to watch for sure and I think you touch on one of not the only, but one of the reasons so many criminal cases, both at the federal level and at the state level, end long before anybody sees the inside of a trial room, the inside of a courthouse, at least for a, tri a trial purpose. It's expensive. It can take a long time. Um, and it can also take a lot of time and a lot of resources from the state as well. And you could go to jail. You could go to jail. Um, plea deals frequently still include some jail time, we should be clear, some prison time sometimes. Um, but there is a pressure on defendants to, in many cases, try to limit their exposure, try to do whatever is in their best interest, and that can be a financial best interest as well as uh, trying to maintain their freedom best interest. Um, there's a, certainly a, a demarcation between some more notably wealthy defendants and some who are of more common means. That's one of the great wraps on the American legal system to begin with, and that is it is a system that has been built with privilege and influence and the ability to oftentimes escape charges that those of, of lesser economic power are unable to do. It's certainly uh, it's a challenge. Um, you know, everybody's uh, innocent until proven guilty in this country. We have a public defender system for that reason, but particularly folks who fall in the income level that disqualifies them from getting uh, a public defender right. provided to them, but below somebody with the means to pay for the most high-powered, yeah. often the most expensive attorneys that are going to uh, file lots of motions on your behalf and really push it, um, those folks can get a little squeezed. Not Is everybody can afford Jerry Spence, right? There's an <laughs> obscure <laughs> reference for it. Uh, okay. So we are, we are hearing that we're getting close to this uh, press conference. I want to talk to you, if we have time here, I just got into my email a, another um, statement from the Trump campaign. They did send one before this, uh, we, when we, before the indictments came down, um, and now here's another one titled the truth about Fonnie Willis and he's really going after her here this campaign is going after her uh, Fonnie Willis is a Democrat activist um, Willis is using the Trump indictment to fundraise and campaign and Zach if you could touch on this while we are waiting for we're under a minute now we're under a minute I'll do this if quickly. we could briefly Trump tried to or excuse me the Trump team tried to get Willis disqualified from even indicting him in the first place and that was shut down yeah, there was a battle on the motions ahead of this, also trying to remove Judge Robert McBurn 
attorney from oversight of any component of this case, the grand jury, the special purpose grand jury, um, all of those motions failed. It's an argument that we may see come up again as we move further into litigation. Um, but right now, the appellate courts effectively said any effort to remove District Attorney Willis or Judge Robert McBurney before an indictment, because this happened before tonight, right. any effort to do that at that point, uh, it was just too early. He said you would have your day in court. That's what he said. All right, we are now, uh, I'm going to guess, under 30 seconds before we are expected to see this news conference begin. And uh, reporters certainly have gathered. Our Savannah Levens is inside that room now. Uh, we have been given the one-minute warning. That was about 50 seconds ago as I am watching the clock here vigilantly. Uh, hopefully they will be like MARTA buses. They will run on time. <laughs> so we'll see. Or a football. It could be a football minute. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good correlation, too. I wish I would have made that one. And all right. I will, I mean, as we're waiting, just to rehash here, if you all are just joining us, this is very big news. The first, or excuse me, fourth criminal indictment for former President Donald Trump. This is a RICO case. 19 people named in this indictment, a total of 41 charges, and as Zach was reporting, 30 unindicted co-conspirators. So a lot of folks. It's, this is going to be different than any uh, criminal indictment that we've seen thus far in the recent months. So we get ready to see Fanny Willis here, the district attorney who defeated Paul Howard about three years ago and this is going to be her on the national stage there have been so many questions about all of this as it has been playing out uh, at a snail's pace over the last two and a half years we heard from uh, the former uh, district attorney of DeKalb County defending how long this has taken Robert James told us a couple of hours ago that this is the way the process is and the way that it works I want to just add too, before we go to this press conference this case in particular many legal experts will tell you worries Trump campaign, worries that Mr. Trump's allies and his attorneys more than some of the other cases. Federal cases, there is, uh, if the former president becomes the president again, he in all likelihood will have the capacity to end federal investigations into his conduct, federal cases against him. He has oversight of the Department of Justice. A state case, there is no such power. This is an independent, independent of the federal government allegation here. It's an independent case here, um, which this is looking far down the line here. Um, but there is no power of the president to pardon anybody charged with state crimes. Yeah. We are not saying at any point, and it shouldn't be misconstrued, that we're saying the former president will be convicted. That's right. for a jury to decide. Um, but... And I'm, oh, go yeah, ahead. Go I, I'm ahead. glad you brought that up because this is something that's been widely talked about. Right. We've done right. multiple verifies on right. it. If President or former President Trump gets convicted in Georgia, can he be pardoned? We know that we have a Republican governor here, and we will hold off on that because we see District Attorney Fonnie Willis walking up to the podium. So let's listen in. Thank you for joining us. I'm here with the prosecutors and investigators who have worked diligently on the investigation of criminal attempts to interfere in the administration of Georgia's 2020 presidential election. Today, based on information developed by that investigation, a Fulton County grand jury returned a true bill of indictment charging 19 individuals with violations of Georgia law arising from a criminal conspiracy to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election in this state. The indictment includes 41 felony counts and is 97 pages long. Please remember that everyone charged in this bill of indictment is presumed innocent. Specifically, the indictment brings felony charges against Donald John Trump, Rudolph William Louis Giuliani, John Charles Eastman, Mark Randall Meadows, 
John Cheeseboro, Jeffrey Clark, Jenna Lynn Ellis, Ray Stallings Smith III, Robert David Cheeley, Michael A. Roman, David James Schaefer, Sean Micah Tresher Steele, Stephen Cliffguard Lee, Harrison William Prescott Floyd, Travion C. Cootie, Sydney Catherine Powell, Kathleen Austin Latham, Scott Graham Hall, and Misty Hampton, also known as Emily Misty Hayes. Every individual charged in the indictment is charged with one count of violating Georgia's Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act through participation in a criminal enterprise in Fulton County, Georgia and elsewhere to accomplish the illegal goal of allowing Donald J. Trump to seize the presidential term of office beginning on January 20th, 21. Specifically, the participants in association took various actions in Georgia and elsewhere to block the counting of the votes of the presidential electors who were certified as the winners of Georgia's 2020 general election. As you examine the indictment, you will see acts that are identified as overt acts and those that are identified as predicate acts, sometimes called acts of racketeering activity. Overt acts are not necessarily crimes under Georgia law in isolation but are alleged to be acts taken in furtherance of the conspiracy. Many occurred in Georgia and some occurred in other jurisdictions and are included because the grand jury believes they were part of the illegal effort to overturn the results of Georgia's 2020 presidential election. The acts identified as predicate acts or acts of racketeering activity are crimes that are alleged to have been committed in furtherance of the criminal enterprise. Acts of racketeering activity are also charged as separate counts in the indictment against those who are alleged to have committed them. All elections in our nation are administered by the states, which are given the responsibility of ensuring a fair process and an accurate counting of the votes. That includes elections for presidential electors, Congress, state officials, and local offices. The state's role in this process is essential to the functioning of our democracy. Georgia, like every state, has laws that allow those who believe that results of an election are wrong whether because of intentional wrongdoing or unintentional error to challenge those results in our state courts. The indictment alleges that rather than abide, abide by Georgia's legal process for election challenges, the defendants engaged in a criminal racketeering enterprise to overturn Georgia's presidential election result. Subsequent to the indictment, as is the normal process in Georgia law, the, the grand jury issued arrest warrants for those who are charged. I am giving the defendants the opportunity to voluntarily surrender no later than noon on Friday, the 25th day of August, 2023. I remind everyone here that an indictment is only a series of allegations based on a grand jury's determination of probable cause to support the charges. It is now the duty of my office to prove these charges in the indictment beyond a reasonable doubt at trial. 
I would like to take a moment to thank, thank the Superior Court Clerk, Shay Alexander, and her staff for staying late and making sure that this indictment was processed. I would also like to thank the men and women of Sheriff Labatt's office for keeping the courthouse open, but most importantly for keeping us safe over the weeks and months that have led up to this indictment and for what I know they will continue to do to keep us safe. We also want to thank the Atlanta Police Department and other law enforcement partners who have worked with the sheriff to keep us safe. I will now take a very limited number of questions prior uh, to going to sleep. <laughs> oh, first, uh, Madam District Attorney. If you don't mind, Savannah Levins with 11 Alive. Quick question, can you clarify in Georgia uh, the mandatory minimum when it comes to RICO charges, whether it's serviceable by probation or how that might play out? The, the RICO charges has time that you have to serve, so it is not a probated sentence. Madam District Attorney, what's the time table for the trial? What is the timetable for the trial? Yes. As you know, in this jurisdiction, trials are set by the judges. Um, and so it will be the judge that sets the date of the trial. This office will be su submitting a proposed scheduling order within this week. However, that will totally be at the discretion of the judge. And you want to be the, you're the fourth person, the fourth jurisdiction now to indict them. You want to be the fourth one to try them, or could you move it up? You want to be the first to try them? don't have any desire to be first or last. I want to try him and be respectful for our sovereign states. Um, we do want to move this case along and so we will be asking for a proposed order that occurs a trial date within the next six months. Madam District Attorney, um, there was an, earlier today there was a fictitious document according to the Fulton County Clerk's Office that was circulated online with charges against former President Donald Trump. Those That fictitious document uh, matched exactly the charges that we now see in this indictment. Can you tell us more about that document leak? Uh, because now you have the former president's lawyers who are saying this is emblematic of a serious problem with your office. No, I can't tell you anything about um, what you refer to. What I can tell you is that we had a grand jury here in Fulton County. They deliberated till almost 8 o'clock, if not right after 8 o'clock. An indictment was returned. It was true billed, and you now have an indictment. Um, I am not an expert on clerks duties um, or even administrative duties. I wouldn't know how to work that system and so I'm not going to speculate. Okay. Next have question. You, have you had any contact with the special counsel about overlap between these cases and do you intend to try all of them together? Thank you. Do I intend to try the 19 defendants in this indictment together? Yes. yes. And have you had any contact with the special counsel about the overlap between this indictment and the federal indictment? I'm not going to discuss our investigation at this time. Yeah, I'm going to take... What do you make of the, uh, the arguments uh, made by former President Trump that this is a politically motivated indictment? I make decisions in this office based on the facts and the law. Um, the law is completely nonpartisan. That's how decisions are made in every case. To date, this office has indicted, since I've been sitting as a district attorney, over 12,000 cases. This is the 11th RICO indictment. We followed the same process. We look at the facts, we look at the law, and we bring charges. Now, I'm going to be Will you try this case yourself? Has the jury been cleared? Get down. down. All right, so you were just listening in to DA Fonnie Willis giving a press conference. And of note, she read all of the names of the 19 people indicted, including former President Donald Trump. And she listed that this was going to be a, a RICO case. And one of the big things that I thought stood out to all of us is that she's giving all of those, those 19 people who are indicted a voluntary surrender. There are arrest warrants now issued for them. She says that they must voluntary surrender by noon, Friday, August 25th, that is next Friday. Zach also had uh, told us maybe an hour ago, uh, we talked a little bit about when this trial could begin, and that is set by the judge. He reinforced that as well. As you and I were listening to this, I sort of whispered over to you, what has surprised you? And you said, well, 
uh, almost an inside baseball kind of term, and that uh, overt acts and predicated acts. What does that mean? Yeah, uh, yeah under the, the Georgia RICO statute, predicate acts are crimes under Georgia law that stand alone. These uh, incidents, if proved, if the allegations are proved, are illegal on their face. They viola violate a specific component of the Georgia state code. Overt acts, uh, you heard the district attorney just a moment ago say it, aren't necessarily crimes under Georgia law on their own, but when prosecutors can prove, as they say they can here, those overt acts are conducted as an effort to further the overall conspiracy, that's when they get dragged into the indictment and into the RICO case. And I think it's worth noting here that both a, an overt act and a predicate act, according to the prosecutors here in this indictment, um, both of those were satisfied in that early, early January 2021 phone call between former President Donald Trump and Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. So the indictment here is saying an incident like that, a piece of evidence like that, is both a violation of Georgia code on its face and also satisfies the Overt Act requirement. Will she lead the prosecution of this herself in the courtroom? I think it's no question that, that she is calling all the shots in this case, whether she will be the Her reputation prosecutor. Based upon it. I think I think this is the biggest case uh, she has ever tried. I don't think that's an exaggeration, and I think this will be the case that Fonnie Willis is remembered for. This is her legacy case here. I want to note, too, that although we did see 41 um, different charges, she focused on the big one in the room, the RICO charge, saying that this is the 11th RICO indictment. She says it follows the same process. She says it's nonpartisan. Um, and then she actually stayed and opened it up the floor for questions. Shout out to our Savannah Levins who actually got the first question in there. Uh, but you know, I thought it was really of note that she spent the time talking about the RICO charge, which is the charge that all 19 folks are charged with. They're not necessarily charged with all 41. Right. right? It, it's, it's really the bedrock of this entire indictment here. Um, all 19, as you mentioned, all 19 of the named defendants are charged with the RICO charge. Uh, that's not the case for others of the 41 charges in this indictment, but the RICO is one where everybody, according yeah. to the prosecutors, were involved. I want to flag, too, just while we're talking about all 19 defendants, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis said point blank, she intends to try all 19 of these defendants together. Mm. which could raise a whole host of logistical and yeah. timetable challenges. Um, we will see how this plays out moving forward, but and, that's and pretty notable reason, to me. And the reason for that is why? I think if you asked 10 lawyers, they'd give you 10 different answers. Yeah. Um, to me, if you're a prosecutor, if you want to build a narrative that a jury can, can understand, um, if you want to and if you believe that a, a full understanding of the narrative requires the full breadth of the evidence that you've collected, then you may want to do it all at the same time. Okay. And we're hearing that our Savannah Levins, who was inside of that press conference, she is joining us live now with an update. Hey, Savannah, so how was it? I mean, we, we're all watching along here, but what can you tell us about from inside that room? Yeah, so they're clearing out right now. Actually, just made a joke that uh, it's time to go to bed. Uh, so a lot of people clearing out, giving us about 10 minutes here to wrap things up. But it was interesting, you know, going over the more than a dozen people being indicted. DA Fani Willis, uh, you know, emphasizing the fact that they are all innocent until proven guilty, offering the opportunity to voluntarily voluntarily surrender uh, up to Friday before these arrest warrants uh, are going to be implemented. And something we ask now that we know that uh, RICO charges involved, and she was talking about. Uh, the racketeering conspiracy all of those buzzwords that are affiliated with that RICO charge uh, one of the questions I asked was whether this comes with a mandatory sentence in Georgia and whether that sentence could be uh, serviced you know on probation so if uh, the president former president is indicted would he have to spend time in prison behind bars or could he potentially be on probation and DA Willis said this is not a prob probationary charge it has mandatory service Service. Uh, so it would be very interesting to see if for potentially the first time the former president and, and the additional people included in this RICO charge might actually have to spend uh, time behind bars. But it was also interesting to hear uh, uh, the DA talk about the fact that, um, you know, she has 
brought this all together as a conspiracy, wanted to stay late tonight, uh, said that the grand jury heard everything they needed to hear uh, to send this forward. She was also asked about that uh, document that was uh, leaked earlier and what her knowledge is of that. And all she said was that she's not an expert on uh, administrative actions and, and the clerk and that she would not be able to comment on that. Uh, some reporters pointed out that it seems to kind of line by line line up with what was released tonight. But again, not a lot of clarification on that. But uh, a lot of clarification and a lot still to be learned about what's going to happen with all of these different people listed in this RICO charge. Uh, the criminal enterprise were words that she used. So it should be interesting to see uh, how that's tried. She said she is going to try them all together. Uh, so we will see how that plays out, certainly. And also interesting to note, you know, we'll see how the former president responds to this as well, because in Manhattan, I mean, he pushed to have this move to federal court. And one of the privileges we have here in Georgia is to be able to have our cameras on and live stream this and have the uh, world really watch this as it unfolds. But if it is pushed back to uh, federal court, as he attempted to do in Manhattan, now that failed. But if he is successful, uh, then that would kind of remove that option for us. But so far, that hasn't happened, although I presume and assume, and maybe Zach can speak more to this, that that might be a fight that happens in the coming days. Uh, but certainly, it's uh, still now a lot of wait and see. Absolutely. And Savannah, we see reporters and folks leaving in droves behind you. But before we let you go, I did want to ask and kind of give you some kudos because you were able to get the first question in there. A lot of reporters, we heard that some people weren't even able to get into that room. It was a little hard to hear. Can you briefly explain what you asked and what her answer was to you? Yeah, so one of the questions I had was RICO cases, this criminal enterprise in Georgia, comes with a mandatory sentence, right? So if the former president is indicted, he would have to serve time in some way. What I asked was whether that could be serviced by probation, whether the former president might not have to go to prison or spend time behind bars. And DA Willis said, this is not serviceable by probation. So if he is convicted, could be potentially actually spending time behind bars and that could be a very you know real possibility depending on how these proceedings play out. Savannah Levins, excellent reporting. Thank you so much for bringing us your perspective and great job out there today. So th this issue, and we talked about it earlier in the evening, but I think as we approach midnight, I think we need to talk about it again. And that is, unlike federal cases, unlike the state of New York and some other states around the country, this will be unique in the sense that it can and will be televised, that people will be able to see the evidence and they will be able to see what happens in the courtroom and they will be able to see the former president and all those other defendants who will be in this room at the same time. Yeah, and I, I want to touch on that. First, I do want to mention, you mentioned the defendants here. Um, you heard the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, say it. I think it's imperative that we repeat it here as well. An indictment does not mean guilt. An indictment merely means that grand jurors, a majority of them, believe that there's probable cause that a crime was committed. This is a serious moment. It is unprecedented in the history of our state. But in a lot of ways, I think we can be most well-read and we can be the smartest we can about this case if we see this more as a starting point than an ending point. This marks mm -hmm. the what will likely be a long march towards trial. And that trial, Jeff, as you mentioned, all odds point to will be televised. Is it uh, the revolution will be televised as the old line goes, right? <laughs> uh, l let me ask you this as well. Is it in the benefit, does it benefit the district attorney for this trial to be going on sooner rather than later? Who has an advantage here if it is delayed X number of months? You heard Fonnie Willis there when asked when she hopes to have her case go to trial especially because we know there are three other cases out in uh, across the country now naming former President Trump as a defendant. And she parried the question a little bit. She said, effectively, uh, she doesn't care if she, she goes first, she doesn't care if she goes last. What she's most interested in is making sure that they can bring the best case that they can. That's a pretty deft non-answer, uh, of course. It's going to be a logistical challenge with four cases now. What, the what are we president. missing now? Are we missing anything else right now that we haven't touched on in your estimation? Uh, you know, I think the uh, coming straight out and saying that defendants have until noon on 
August 25th, 25th mm -hmm. to present themselves here in Georgia. I think that's a little over, what, 10, 11 days to from now? voluntarily turn themselves in. So that makes right. me think, if they don't voluntarily turn themselves in, are we going to see some type of raids? I think that would be uh, highly surprising. Yeah. We never know. There are 19 people named as defendants here, but um, at least as far as the former president is concerned, in all three of his other cases, he has voluntarily appeared at the date and time he was asked to appear. Um, he has complied with those, I don't want to call them invitations, but has complied with the court order to appear. Absolutely. All right, Zach, thank you very much. We have been pouring through the indictment to help you understand these charges. We have, we have had them in our hand over the last uh, 45 minutes to 60 minutes. And at the beginning of the document, the DA's office now lays out the case for the RICO charges against all of the defendants. So we're going to bring in our very own Ron Jones to explain. Yeah, so there's a lot to pour through here, right? We're talking about 97 pages, 41 charges, 19 people. We're going to try to make this RICO case into chunkables for everybody to understand. So there are eight main points we need to talk about. So the first two, making false statements and trying to influence state lawmakers and other high-ranking officials like Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. Then they cite creating a false electoral group. That would be the fake elector scheme. Now, the case also includes the harassment of Fulton County election workers as well, one in particular. And the RICO case also says that the scheme included trying to solicit the Department of Justice, Vice President Mike Pence, Hence as well. The indictment also talks about what happened up in Coffee County, something that has been making our headlines here in Georgia quite often, alleging the unlawful breach of election equipment. And the final point, which is really important here, that not only did the defendants try to sway the election, but they also attempted to cover it all up. So we're going to continue to go through this indictment, learn a lot more information about the details of this case against the former president, the fake electors, the Trump allies as well. And as you've been hearing all night long, Long investigative reporter Zach Merchant and his team are digging through all the details. They're going to continue to dig through that 97-page indictment, and we posted the full document on our website, 11alive.com. Guys, it's a lot to get through, Ron. A Thank lot. you so much for taking sure. the time to break it down for us. And once again, you can read this full indictment for yourselves. We have it posted right now at 11alive.com. Uh, and first, we want to get back out to our Caitlin Ross. She is standing by live for us. We just saw that press conference wrap up inside of the courthouse. Caitlin, it's all yours. Give us some observations, some thoughts as you listened in on the news conference from the district attorney. Well, Jeff and Faith, it was real divided attention. Everyone was trying to listen to what DA Fonnie Willis was saying while also trying to read that indictment. 98 pages long, a lot of information, 19 people named in the indictment. There is so much to go through. And I think people had one ear on that, one eye on this, trying to figure out what this all is going to mean. I've been talking to some state representatives who said, listening to DA Willis's timeline, gosh, what's happening in six months? The legislature is back in session. Already one legislature tour indicted in this 98 page indictment. So isn't the timing of this going to be interesting in the state of Georgia? This is what everyone is going to be paying attention to, not only just tomorrow in the months and years to come. This indictment is going to have major impacts on the upcoming election. We're going to be hearing a lot of breakdown about what this all is going to mean going line by line through that. And that's why I think it's been so interesting listening to Zach tonight, getting his legal perspective on what these things mean. We know that RICO is a difficult thing to prove. We know DA Fannie Willis brought in a special counsel specifically to look at that RICO charge and to try and break down how all of these elements could be connected, which is the most important thing you have to prove to bring that RICO charge. She's been working on this investigation for two and a half years, and I think you heard that punctuated in her news conference. She was very clear. She was very concise. She was really hitting those points of the things that she investigated over these past two and a half years, and I think she wanted to make sure sure that she was able to get that out tonight. The timeline was interesting because when we were first talking about this, we thought we were going to be hearing on Tuesday or Wednesday of this week about an indictment. But once things got rolling, it's like they just took on a power of their own. It got moving very, very quickly. We had our chief photojournalists down here around 1030 this morning. When they were setting up, it was all of a sudden, wait a minute, there's this flurry of activity. It looks like it's going to happen today. And that's why we saw dozens and dozens of journalists down here, dozens of police officers 
officers really guarding the roads. Even looking out to my left and right right now, you see those police lights still flashing. Still a huge presence here on Pryor Street. The street itself still closed to traffic. We know that it could remain closed up until August 18th, but now listening to DA Willis's timeline on those people named in the indictment having until August 25th to surrender themselves, is this going to remain closed down? We know we see a lot of media positions, people broadcasting entire shows from outside the courthouse. I was speaking to a security guard inside the government building, which where the news conference was held, and he looked out the window and said, geez, I have never seen anything like this before. It's just a huge amount of people, a crush of information, and so much information. We are definitely going to be sorting through this in the days and weeks to come. Jeff and Faith. All right, Caitlin Ross, thank you. Good work tonight. We have really enjoyed listening to you and watching you tonight with uh, the very latest information from downtown. Uh, we had talked earlier tonight about Georgia's RICO laws being very strident and very strong, maybe more so than anywhere else uh, in the country. I, I have a longtime friend, longtime journalist here who's an Atlanta native uh, who shall remain nameless, who, who's texted me tonight, goes, well, I, I want to give you a little history as to why RICO laws are so strident and so strong in the state of Georgia. And, and the reason was the uptick of, of violence, of gang murders in Atlanta in the 1970s when the murder rate was up and the legislature uh, became involved, thus you see the derivation of the RICO laws that became very strong here, that it goes back uh, some 45 years. A little bit of Atlanta history? A little bit of Atlanta history, and, and uh, my journalist friend, thank you for that. Well, that is one of 41 charges that we're seeing in this indictment, 98 pages. This is the fourth criminal indictment for former President Donald Trump. He, along with 18 other people, are listed in this indictment. Moments ago, we heard from DA Fonnie Willis, who listed name by name, here's some of the top ones, Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, John Eastman, Mark Meadows, like I said, 19 people listed in this indictment, 30 unindicted co-conspirators, uh, and they are all facing this RICO charges. Some of them will be facing additional charges. She has given them up until noon, that's noon, Friday, August 25th, that's next Friday, to voluntarily turn themselves in. They do have arrest warrants out. So in the coming days, we will likely see folks starting to turn themselves in. Sheriff Pat Labot said he's going to treat the people charged just like anybody else that would be charged in Fulton County. So it's going to be interesting to see how that comes out. Once again, you can read this full indictment on 11alive.com. Uh, and Jeff, before we tune out, do you have any final words for the folks watching today? Well, I'm going to dish it over to Zach for some final words some words of gravity, someone who actually knows what he's talking about tonight. And it's been great to have you with us. You're the newest member of our staff here. You, uh, you were in Georgetown Law School, and your insight has been absolutely I, piercing. I shouldn't say final words, because we are going to continue right, our coverage right. on 11alive.com. Right. We're just wrapping it up right here on, on air. I think those are maybe the best final words. We are going to be here. We're going to be here <laughs> All going night. forward. I will, I will just say this. I think two of the biggest points I think we can't stress enough. One. Everybody named as a defendant today is presumed innocent. An indictment is an enormously serious moment, certainly if you're named as a defendant, but also in this case for anybody who calls the state of Georgia home. This is an unprecedented, historic day for the city of Atlanta and the state of Georgia. That said, everybody named today is innocent until proven guilty. What we now, what is our job, and everybody who's watching now as well, it's all of our charges to follow this all the way to the end. Follow the evidence, pay attention, and make up our own minds about what is, in no exaggeration, I think the biggest case that's ever come through the state of Georgia. Absolutely. Well, Zach, Jeff, thank you all so much. We are going to stay on top of this for you on 11alive.com. We thank you, everyone who is tuning us, tuning in on air. Our coverage will continue with 11 Alive Morning News starting at 4.30 a.m. Uh, and once again, if you are watching us on air right now, go ahead, open up your phones, open up your laptops, and go to 11alive.com because we are continuing coverage, diving in to this major indictment.
right, welcome back everyone. We have uh, been having a very full night as we continue to follow the developments of District Attorney Fannie Willis as we are learning about the indictments and we have seen uh, uh, that uh, the former President of the United States headlines a group yeah. of 19 individuals. Yep, and RICO charges for 19 individuals, 30 co-conspirators, uh, unindicted I should say. 30 unindicted, that's right. Uh, and our Zach Merchant, he is the one guy here that went to law school helping us break it down. Uh, and moments ago, DA Willis wrapped up a press conference. She laid out some of the nuts and bolts in the nearly 100 page indictment, announcing charges against 19 people, including former President Donald Trump. We're gonna toss it out to our Savannah Levins, who was inside of the room where DA Fonnie Willis gave that press conference, Savannah. And you were able to ask the first question after that press to the DA Willis. So what, are, what can you break down what we heard tonight? Well, so uh, DA Willis came in and basically broke down that, you know, 19 individuals are a part of this criminal conspiracy, as she called it. Obviously, what we are referring to as RICO charges, she used the words criminal enterprise, obviously emphasizing that all the people named are presumed innocent until found guilty. She said she is going to try them all together. Uh, but something that was interesting to learn tonight was the fact that this is being pushed through as a RICO charge, which most people generally know better as being affiliated with uh, mafia, gang, you know, criminal crime, uh, uh, conspiracy, things like that, racketeering. Um, so to see it in this context is certainly unique. And the question that I asked uh, was about the mandatory sentence that comes with RICO charges in Georgia in particular, because obviously right now uh, the former president has not really been facing any immediate uh, prison time, but there is a minimum sentence that comes with a RICO charge. So what I asked was whether that was serviceable through probation, whether it was possible that if he is uh, found guilty, that the former president might not actually have to spend any time behind bars. And D.A. Willis said that no, in fact, this charge is not serviceable for serviceable, I should say, by probation. So if he is found guilty of these RICO charges, of this criminal conspiracy, he may very well be facing actual prison time. Now, it'll be interesting to see what happens from here in the next few days. Obviously, we know uh, Trump had fought in the uh, Manhattan case trying to push it from Manhattan to federal court and one of the privileges we have here in Georgia is being able to uh, have cameras rolling through these proceedings and being able to see it and witness it all firsthand and live that certainly would not be the case if it is moved back to a federal court it would be a different judge a different jury uh, now that attempt failed in the Manhattan case but it would be interesting to see uh, if Trump and his allies try to do that uh, in this case as well. I'm just looking at some of the notes we had here. Again, um, DA Willis saying that these people named in this indictment, she's giving them about 10, 11 days until August 22nd, I believe, that Friday to volunteer, voluntarily surrender, um, but arrest warrants are officially active. Um, and, and so again, she's saying that emphasizing innocent until proven guilty. But I want to go back to kind of some of the things that we've been monitoring um, uh, and questions we've been getting, one of which has been, can Governor Kemp pardon the president of these charges? And I want to kind of talk about the historical context of why he cannot. In fact, Georgia is one of only a few, I believe, six states that does not allow a sitting governor to offer pardons. And that actually goes back to the 30s in Georgia when a Klansman was elected uh, uh, a governor went from the state Senate to the governor's office and would actually hand out pardons for the highest price in Fulton County prison yards. And so in the 40s, I believe it was 1943, they passed uh, this legislation, uh, legislative action that uh, takes that power away from the governor so that no future governor uh, could abuse that power of a pardon. And so now it would have to go to a board. But again, these are all things we've been speculating all night, frankly, about what these indictments say. And now we're speculating about what happens next. But that's the kind of background there. And a common question that we're getting is whether uh, that pardon could happen. And 
No. And also, you know, another question is whether if he is elected president again, uh, former President Trump could pardon himself. In the federal case, yes. In the Georgia case, no, which is what makes this case so poignant and so important. I mean, a lot of people probably have fatigue, indictment fatigue at this point, seeing it happen and wondering how Fulton County, how tonight is different. It is very different. These charges have significant staying power, not only because it's under the state jurisdiction, but because the governor does not have the power to pardon any of them. The president does not have the power to pardon himself. And again, it's going to be televised as these proceedings move forward, which is unprecedented and certainly would never happen in a federal case. But it was very interesting to hear D.A. Willis tonight talk about the long night ahead. She thanked uh, Sheriff Pat Labod and uh, all the team for keeping the courtroom open late tonight. They had multiple uh, witnesses who were called today and didn't actually hear from all of them. But it was interesting to see. We for a long time thought that this certainly wouldn't come down tonight. And then we started getting word that at least two of the witnesses who were scheduled to testify tomorrow, Tuesday, were called at some point today and asked to come in earlier to come in today. Uh, and so we kind of were on red alert at that point that something might be happening, that this was moving very quickly and move quickly it did. We saw uh, the, the the judge get those uh, uh, papers and then they were read into uh, into the clerk of court and into the record and then uh, D.A. Willis giving that, that update for us uh, just under an hour ago. Savannah Levins, thank you so much for your reporting just now and also throughout the entire night. We know you were in that room when the press conference happened. We'll be coming back to you, I'm sure, later on this evening. I wanted to circle back on two points that, that you made. First, uh, I'm so glad that you mentioned the pardon rules here in the state of Georgia. People think of uh, the governor having unlimited pardon power. That's not the case here in our state. I also want to cite one point the district attorney Fonnie Willis made in her press conference um, that some, uh, at least one well-placed legal source is, is texting me and is saying may not be quite right. This is going to be something we're going to be looking into uh, down the line here. It's, it has to do with the penalties for a RICO conviction. This is obviously looking way down the line here. There has been no conviction. Everybody named, we've said it, and we're going to keep saying it, is presumed innocent. Having said that, District Attorney Fonnie Willis said in the press conference, if I have it right, that uh, effectively there is a mandatory minimum prison sentence if somebody is convicted under the Georgia State RICO charge, which is true, but I want to add a little bit of, of context here. And to be clear, this is not in any way suggesting that the district attorney um, misspoke or uh, deliberately left some stuff out. That's not it at all. Um, it's a big code book and we just want to make sure we're going through all of it. The RICO statute penalties section in the Georgia Code reads as follows. Any person convicted of the offense of engaging in activity in violation of this code section shall be guilty of a felony and shall be punished by not less than five nor more than 20 years imprisonment or and this is the operative word potentially here, or the fine specified in subsection B of this code section. So um, a, a close reading of this uh, the statute in the text here seems to suggest that somebody convicted of a RICO charge could face prison time, or they could face a fine, or they could face both. Um, a well-placed legal source who's been in the Fulton County legal community for many, many years uh, has the same reading of this penalty section. This is going to be something, though, that um, we're going to be keeping a close eye on moving forward. And thankfully, we have a long time to figure that out because today is a big night, um, but we are still a long, long, long way away from the, any trial here. This is really the beginning of the process, moving towards trial. A long way indeed, Zach. Thank you so much for giving us your insight and perspective. So a big question that we are seeing right now is about the potential of former President Donald Trump having a mugshot taken in Fulton County. It would be his first one in his now four criminal indictments. And after the federal indictment, we are going to actually toss to Grace to talk about if he'll get a mugshot. Well, after the federal indictment in the New York case, Mr. Trump stood by his words and he said that 
He's the vice position, calling the investigation into him and his allies politically motivated. But that hasn't stopped Trump's campaign from using fake mugshots in fundraising campaigns and merchandise. We went directly to the man who would know if there could be a Trump mugshot in Fulton County, Sheriff Pat Labatt. Unless someone tells me differently, we are we are following our part our, our normal practices. And so it doesn't matter your status. We we have mugshots ready for you. Former Fulton County Assistant District Attorney Daryl Cohen agrees. So if that is the case, it's not gonna be normal normal because normal normal would take him to the Fulton County Jail on Rice Street. That's not going to happen in my view. I think what will happen, it will be at the Fulton County Courthouse, the Justice Center, and he will be photographed and fingerprinted. I think that will be the normal. So we can say yes, there could likely be a Fulton County mugshot coming soon, unless something changes with the instructions given by the judge assigned to the case. Faith. Grace, thank you so much for breaking down that for us. That's been a really big question. That question, and then the question of could Trump pardon himself in Georgia? Savannah just explained that no, he can't do that. The governor can't do that. It's a group of right. folks that would have to. Let so me. I'm, I'm so sorry, no, Jeff. No, go ahead. Let me. Continue. Let me just jump in here too. When we start talking about pardons, uh, I, I think I've, I've seen this floating on. I want to say Twitter, uh, the platform formerly known as Twitter I think X. I've been saying Twitter all night. Um, Sorry, they are Twitter. still, I think, technically tweets. Um, <laughs> Old habits die hard, you know? Uh, this is a new, you know, it's a new thing we're getting used to. Formerly known as Twitter. On social media, we can say safely. On social media, I have been uh, seeing the idea floating and circulating that uh, a president can pardon him or herself uh, from any federal convictions. We don't know that for sure. This is untested legal ground um, and what you can bet is that if a president a sitting president moves to pardon him or herself mm -hmm. that it would set up a major constitutional question that would almost certainly finally and ultimately be decided by the Supreme Court again I'm gonna sound a little redundant here but I think it's just so important every time we talk about any convictions we need to caveat and say Everybody who is named today is presumed innocent. Nobody has been convicted at trial. No jury, no trial jury has come out and said unanimously that defendant A or B or C, all the way down to you know 19 of them, yeah. committed this crime beyond a reasonable doubt. So we're sort of telescoping in and out in terms of uh, where we're looking down the timeline. But there are a lot of, as we do look down the range, a lot of uh, untested and pretty murky legal waters that could be ahead for us. You know, what's interesting is we came into this night over the course of X number of months with a lot of questions about moving parts and how many different sort of variables they are in this. The interesting thing is the more information that we have, the more questions we have as yeah. well. I mean, the, there's so many variables here, it's almost hard to wrap your head around. Um, it, it, it's, it's a big case. It's a big indictment at 19. Is it named. overreaching? I'm in no position to say. I really couldn't say. Um, I think if you asked uh, former President Trump's legal team and his supporters, I think they would say unequivocally yes, of course. Um, I think they would, you'd be hard pressed to see anything positive about a case charging former President Trump coming from partisans of the former president. I think if you asked District Attorney Fonnie Willis, you would say, no, of course not. It isn't overreaching. It is a representation of the crimes that were committed. This is her speaking, or at least what we think she would say. If there is overreaching, is there a risk for Fannie Willis? Here? You know, I, I spoke to the district attorney, I want to say a few weeks ago. Um, it's, it's been a pretty busy few weeks here, but we spoke to her at a press event she held before any indictments were unsealed, before any indictments were announced, and I asked her, I said, there are those in the legal community who say the YSL trial, which is a RICO case if you're in Atlanta, and I know and we're very grateful for the many people around the country who are watching from outside uh, the city and the state, but for those who know um, Atlanta, 
The RICO case in the YSL has been going on for months. It's taken yeah. a long time. I asked the district attorney if she worried that this case could be a long one as well, and uh, she basically rejected the premise of the question and yeah. said, Absolutely. this is business as usual. Absolutely. And, you know, Young Thug, a lot of people outside of Atlanta know who that is. All right. We want to get back out to our Caitlin Ross, who is standing by live outside of the Fulton County Courthouse, where there has been just a ton of activity today, Caitlin, after a relatively quiet week last week. So looking ahead, this is not going to be the last night that we see activity there. We know that um, security was slated to be there until the 18th. Now we see this deadline of the 25th. I'm wondering, I don't know if we have word yet, if there's going to be any expanded security measures or preparation. That's such a great question. I think one that a lot of people are wondering about. It's crazy just how quickly this all went up around the Fulton County Courthouse, barricades surrounding the entire building, and police officers taking this very seriously, guarding the entries and exits, armed guards, their lights running in their car the entire day. Even now, past midnight, you still see those officers lining the street and taking this very seriously. Everywhere that the activity moved here, you would see a police officer following that activity. And D.A. Fonnie Willis called that out in her news conference, saying she was really grateful to APD, all of the law enforcement partners who really made sure that this was a safe process. There certainly was a lot of attention on this process. National media here from dawn till dusk covering this entire thing. We are starting to see some of those media outlets break down now, so it's getting a little bit quieter out here. There was a real frenzy of activity as we were waiting to see what the grand jury was going to do when we were hearing the grand jurors were voting when those indictments were being handed up. Now people are breaking that down and I think moving into the next phase, which is really analyzing what's in this indictment and then what's to come. I think this is going to take up a lot of time, a lot of people already speculating what this is going to mean for the 19 people who are named, but then the 30 people who are unnamed. I was just talking to a state house representative who says it's likely that more people are going to be named down the line. Are more people going to be charged? He said one thing's for certain, people named in this indictment better start hiring attorneys if they don't already have one. So I think now we're starting to see this area break down a little bit and a lot of forward looking right now. Jeff, I think you were calling out there's so many variables here, which is a really interesting part of this. No one really knows what's going to happen next. This is really untested, unchartered waters, and certainly all eyes are going to be on Atlanta tomorrow as we get all of the legal experts in here to break down just what happened and what it's going to mean moving forward, not just for Georgia, but the entire country. All right, Caitlin Ross, thank you, Zach. Before I go to Ripley, uh, Joe Ripley, a quick question here. Sure. When there are these many variables in a case, when things become so complicated, they become very difficult to handle, are they not if you're a prosecutor? I think, yeah. I mean, I, I think anytime you expand the scope of your criminal prosecution, it becomes more complex. It's why uh, charging uh, you know, simple battery typically is much easier to bring to a conviction than uh, a complex, complex felony cases. So I think just from a, a sheer scope and logistics standpoint, yes, it's going to be challenging. But I would also caution that this is such uh, an untested, unusual, yeah. unprecedented moment that a prosecutor may well say that it is in their best best interest to bring what they believe is the full scope, the right. full story, because jurors are pretty smart, they're pretty engaged, and they're going to ask probing questions as they deliberate of the prosecution's case. And so being able to present them with what the district attorney's office clearly thinks is a very broad, robust, full depiction of all that happened may be, in their calculation, uh, their best chance of bringing a case to conviction before a jury. All right, to Joe Ripley downtown. Joe, we have been checking in with you all night long as as you stand here at 1226. How has your view of the circumstances of the evening evolved from the first time that we talked to you uh, around five o'clock today? It looks like a lot more cars moving back behind him yeah. too now. Uh, yeah, I think some concert goers are being let out. There was something up the road. I think Beyonce was playing at the Benz. Nothing major. The, the major news, in fact, happening behind us. This is unreal, unprecedented. You hear that word thrown out a lot, but you've heard Zach mention it. You've heard others tonight in our coverage. We've never seen anything like this before in Georgia. A, a former president being charged. Um, he's facing 13 charges as former president Donald Trump. And 
You heard from Fulton DA Fani Willis listing out, outlining what she believes happened. And basically, this comes down to uh, a conspiracy in her eyes and going about this thing the wrong way in trying to win the presidency uh, and, and Donald Trump's shoes. She's listed uh, 41 charges for 19 defendants who we will see uh, hopefully at some point over the next now 10 days before the 25th of August at noon. And this is uh, what she says uh, is a criminal enterprise to accomplish the illegal goal of seizing the presidency. Um, and seizing has its own connotation in, in those words, but the state's role Willis mentioned was essential in administering elections and upholding democracy. In her eyes, this indictment alleging that this was not the case, whether it was here in Georgia, in particular phone calls made or tweets posted uh, or uh, calls made outside of the state of Georgia. This is what this RICO Act violation here is kind of encompassing. And so this is what we may see play out. We're already seeing some of the logistical nightmares that could crop up when it comes to RICO charges, say in this YSL trial that has yet to officially get underway. They've spent months trying to uh, accumulate jurors who can actually hear this case, but you know, we've heard about all the hardships, how difficult it will be to sit uh, a juror uh, pool, 12 jurors plus some alternates here, uh, when it comes to hearing this case. You've got to find people who are not biased, people who have not really heard about this case, and that's going to be extremely difficult. Uh, especially with all the media coverage that's to come in the coming days and weeks ahead. But in the immediate, in the short term, we can absolutely expect motions to come out uh, from those who believe that these defendants, 19 in total, should not be tried altogether, that maybe one defendant feels that he should not be lumped in with maybe another uh, defendant who's facing uh, an, a related but a little tangential charge. So we'll have to wait and see just how this thing is tried uh, once we get to that point. But for now, we'll send things back to you. As we monitor things, you, you might see some concert goers and uh, media crew wrapping up behind me. Uh, but an eventful day for sure, though a long one here outside the Fulton County Courthouse. Joe, thank you so much for your perspective and hustling all day for us down there. We appreciate it. And Great right job, now, Joe. <laughs> and right now we want to get out to our Cody Alcorn, who is breaking down all of the preparation and security. As you all know, we are just getting started here, folks. DA Fani Willis has given these 19 folks charged up until uh, the 25th of August by noon. That's next Friday. So we are going to see a lot of security. Cody Alcorn joining us Lab Cody, what are you learning when it comes to security? This is by far the biggest case that this courthouse has ever seen. That's right, and today's likely the biggest news day the state has seen in quite some time. That is until the president, the former president of the United States, is arrested, and that will happen when he turns himself in prior to the 25th. So we saw a lot of security out here. We still do outside the courthouse, but now you've got to think about what happens next. So they're going to have their first appearance, these 19 suspects, including the former president. That's going to happen over at the Rice Street Jail, the Fulton County Sheriff's Office. Uh, jail. They'll turn themselves into authorities. Now, those hearings are at 9 a.m. Monday through Fridays. If it's a weekend hearing on a Saturday, it'll be at 11 a.m. Those are set already ahead of time. But will they get some special treatment? We don't know. We heard the sheriff saying that he plans to book the former president as any other suspect. But in reality, the Secret Service has the final say in that. We have seen that in other indictments where they come in and they control what happens because they are responsible for the former president and his security. So what's going to be happening now is they are going to be working with Trump's team to get him here. That's going to be shutting down the interstate, shutting down the roads to get him from the airport to the Rice Street Jail and then the security around that. We already know what that place looks like on the inside. They are not going to put the former president inside that jail. We know the situation is under an investigation already uh, for civil rights. So 
What's likely going to happen is what we've seen before. Uh, they'll bring him in. That hearing will be broadcast. We've heard that they are likely going to let cameras in. Uh, so, but it's going to be interesting to see how they treat the other suspects that come in. There again, the former president's only one of 19. So how will they treat the others here? And will they be booked differently than the former president? That's something to see. But the uh, whole process here just getting started because the security angle, as we mentioned, that's the top priority, keeping these defendants safe. You're going to see protests, probably more than we saw today, because now people will know when this will be happening they'll be out there to voice their opinions either on one side or the other but um, hopefully you haven't been to Rice Street Jail but if you've been over there it's kind of down a long uh, roadway or a driveway so it's not really open to the public as say you can't really see it so again it's gonna be kind of off limits for most public because it'll probably stop people from the driveway but it's gonna be interesting to see how the sheriff's office does work with the Secret Service and how security goes uh, forward uh, we lost our lights we get that turned back on but again all of that will start now that we have a timetable of when they will start turning themselves in likely uh, the president's team has been knowing about this so they've already done this what now three other times so they're pretty uh, rehearsed on what they need to do you know Cody I, I, I really have a question for you in that I hadn't thought about this before that they're not going to take him to the jail correct I mean where where would they do these photos of these mug shots for all of these men and women that have been indicted but where does that happen is it a special room they have set up that is not in conjunction with the jail if you commit a a, a crime in this city and you're taken there that's a good question and that's something likely that the sheriff will be working with the Secret Service at least when it comes to the former president yes, sir, other than the, sure. that we don't really know how those other 18 suspects will be treated because again they don't really have special privileges as the former president who had uh, most of his stuff goes through Secret Service but I mean if you're arrested on a normal basis say for a felony you're going to Rice Street you're going to be booked there they're going to take your picture fingerprints and then they lock you up now will that happen in these cases the president hasn't had a mugshot taken yet. They've used other pictures. And again, we heard the sheriff say that he plans to treat these suspects just like any other suspect that turns themselves in on a felony or misdemeanor charge. But again, we're talking about the former president of the United States. Will Secret Service allow him to have a mugshot taken? But, you know, the president, the former president has used this as a campaign stump. So I wouldn't be surprised if he wants his mugshot. He will use that for his campaign and probably have a speech afterwards, maybe outside the jail and use that as part of his campaign. As you know, he is the leader right now when it comes to the Republican nomination. So. We'll see. He's played this. He's played along with this, uh, but I'm sure there's a lot of security going into this with these suspects. Rudy Giuliani is a high profile as well. So, again, it's going to be interesting to see how the sheriff sets this up and how they work with these defendants to turn themselves in and how this goes forward as far as the booking and their surrendering. Yeah, I'm really interested to see how much theater is involved in all of this because both both sides certainly want to use it to their advantage, particularly as uh, Mr. Trump is uh, is way out in front in the poll and has already shown the early indications that he will play this certainly and frame it in a political nature. Absolutely. All right, we want to go to John Shurek, who is now with us once again downtown outside of the courthouse. John, it's all yours. Focusing on what District Attorney Fonnie Willis said, that her office will be submitting a timeline, a proposed timeline, to the court for this trial and to whatever judge is selected at random to uh, handle this case going forward once everybody's turned themselves in and, and they've had their first appearance. She said six months. She wants to hold this trial in six months. And everybody already knows, I'm sure, that that is what the prosecution does. They go for a speedy trial knowing that there is no way ever that there is going to be this case heard and tried within six months. Everybody in the YSL racketeering case that she is prosecuting uh, was probably uh, interested to hear her say that given that jury selection has taken months. All of the defendants uh, in that case, multiple defendants, sitting in a courtroom every single day. And I don't know if in a racketeering case it, it's possible with all 19 of these defendants now named in a racketeering charge if they are allowed to move for separate trials. If they have to be tried all as one set of defendants because they're all 
charged in the same case with the same crime in addition to other charges that that many of them are facing uh, not all facing the same charges at once except for the racketeering count so uh, they may all have to be tried together will they all be sitting in the courtroom president trump and the 18 others day after day month after month trying to get a jury to hear this case this it this is not something that's going to be wrapping up anytime I would guess, I think safely to say, in 2024. John Sherrick reporting for us. John, thank you for your great work tonight. We appreciate it. All right. We are also uh, joined by uh, Ron Jones right now, who is with us. He has the very latest. Yeah, so Ron, what other cases involve former President Trump? We know that this is not the only one, but still, we can say that it is unprecedented. Yeah, unprecedented, but guess what? All eyes are on Georgia right now. The spotlight is on our state right now because of, of what has happened with the RICO charges. But Fulton County, there are three other cases involving Donald Trump, and he is facing criminal charges there. First of all, this began with New York City. Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg is looking at two claims that Mr. Trump paid hush money to actress Stormy Daniels during his run for president in 2016. So those payments were allegedly efforts to bury allegations of sexual encounters with the adult film actor. Also, the FBI is looking to determine how classified documents ended up unsecured at Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort. The former president is charged along with an aide plus a Mar-a-Lago maintenance worker for obstructing justice, refusing to return those documents and attempting to delete surveillance footage as well. And we know about this one. This one is making headlines all across the United States, across our planet. Special counsel Jack Smith just indicted Mr. Trump for his role in the January 6th insurrection. So on August 3rd, Trump pled not guilty to four criminal charges related to the Capitol attack and his alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election. So even if former President Trump is convicted, he says that he will continue to run for the White House. He'll be able to still run for the White House in 2024, guys. All right, Ron, thank you. Let's go to Savannah Levins right now in downtown Atlanta. Savannah. And Savannah was actually inside of the room where Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis gave her press conference. She read out the full names of each of the 19 indicted. Uh, she said that they had until August 25th, that's next Friday by noon, to voluntarily turn themselves in. And now we do have Savannah. She was inside. She was one of the first reporters to ask DA Willis a question. So I think we do have Savannah live now. Savannah, thank you so much for staying up for us. Yeah, we know it's late. So what can you tell us? Yeah, so right now I'm actually going through the uh, 97 pages and the 19 people who are included in this indictment and a few notable ones I want to uh, kind of call out right now. One of them being John Eastman, who is the attorney behind the alleged fake elector scheme, sending at least two memos that we know of uh, to former President Trump and his camp, saying that essentially then Vice President Mike Pence could refuse to count uh, the electoral college votes uh, for Biden. Uh, we are told that Vice uh, President uh, Pence refused to do so, of course. And then also, you know, Jenna Ellis, the attorney uh, also involved in, uh, you know, alleging voter fraud, is also included in this indict indictment. Similarly, had memos to Trump's campaign saying that Pence could and in fact should uh, decline these uh, electoral college votes. And another one I want to pull up, and again, I'm just kind of reading off of this 97 page indictment right now. Sidney Powell, the attorney who was allegedly involved in the uh, Coffee County situation, uh, reportedly uh, and allegedly copying data. So it's interesting to see all of these uh, different players. And while we don't know exactly what evidence uh, was given to and presented to the grand jury, we can kind of see who is named in this indictment and make some assumptions or educated guesses, I'll say, based on what we already know of these individuals named. Now, again, we're looking at RICO charges. We're hearing from D.A. Willis at that press conference about an hour ago saying that this was a criminal conspiracy. Um, one thing she did mention was that a lot of these charges are split into what she called predicate acts versus 
overt acts. Now, overt acts, she said, are not necessarily crimes in themselves, but when they are lumped into a RICO case, that is where they're relevant. Predicate crimes are crimes in themselves. So that's kind of an interesting distinction she made. And then, Zach, you know, I was curious because she also mentioned that the grand jury was factoring in other jurisdictions, potentially other states, saying that it was relevant for this RICO charge. So I'm curious your thoughts on, on that, if that is something that is unprecedented as well, um, but certainly a lot to go over. And again, all these people I'm talking about, all the 19 named in this indictment, presumed innocent until found guilty and have until uh, the 25th to voluntarily turn themselves in. DA Willis saying that uh, you know those arrest warrants are going to be going out. But yeah, Zach, curious your thoughts on uh, DA Willis saying that the grand jury took into consideration other jurisdictions and what happened in other jurisdictions in this decision and in this kind of RICO umbrella. Well, Savannah, thank you very much for great reporting all throughout the evening. Let's answer your question as best I can here. We've been talking about the RICO statute, how it provides county district attorneys with more power than they typically have in terms of where they can reach their prosecution into. The RICO statute gives prosecutors the power to extend cases outside of their traditional jurisdictional bounds. And I think that's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. That's what Savannah was citing. As we talk about extending the jurisdictional boundaries past what is typical for a, a usual case out of Fulton County or Gwinnett County or whatever county it might be, we spent a lot of time, rightly so tonight, talking about some of the biggest names uh, named in this indictment. But there is Another incident, alleged incident, that uh, occurred, according to prosecutors, in South Georgia's Coffee County. This is, uh, the allegation at least goes, that a group of uh, GOP activists helped outside third-party individuals take, effectively, copies of uh, hard drives on election machines in the Coffee County Elections Office. This is count 32 of 41 here in the nearly 100 page indictment and it reads in relevant part here Scott Graham Hall aided abetted and encouraged employees of this outside contractor in willfully tampering with electronic ballot markers and tabulating machines while inside the Coffee County Elections and Registration Office in Coffee County Georgia mm -hmm. Doug Richards in particular Nick Wooten as well and others have done extensive reporting on these allegations out of Coffee County, Eleven Alive, through their efforts, has obtained a recording of Mr. Hall uh, where he is allegedly heard talking about what happened that night. I think we have this soundbite. If we do, let's uh, tee it up right now. I'm the guy that chartered the jet to go down to Coffee County to have them inspect all of those bit, computers. Maybe. I went down there. We scanned every freaking ballot. So that uh, is the words, according to this recording, of Scott Hall, a, a GOP activist. We should mention again, though, he's named in this indictment, but still innocent until proven guilty. This is the beginning for him, as with the other 18 defendants, of what comes next, which is the long march towards a trial. It is the beginning toward the trial. It is the end of our broadcast day and <laughs> night here on 11 Alive and 11 Alive Digital. We have been uh, talking about this for six hours and we will continue to talk about it uh, without end because it is endlessly fascinating. It has so many moving parts at this point. Trying to understand it, trying to wrap our heads around it is difficult, but we will do so and we will bring you all the latest information that we know to share with you about the events. And gentlemen, I have to say it was a pleasure sharing the desk with both and of with you, you all tonight. And thank you all for joining us on air and online. Our coverage continues bright and early in just a few hours here on 11 Alive New Morning News at 4.30. We're going to be breaking down this and I'm sure that you will be seeing us again in the coming days as we await arraignments um, and so much more. We're just getting started here, folks. Have a great night.